record and call the meeting to order. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Basine? Here. Hampson? Here. Gabriel? Present. Jordan? Here. Martin? Present. Rousen? Here. Clanton? Present. Um, do I hear a motion um, to entertain a motion to go into executive closed session? I move we go into executive closed session. Thank you. Do I hear a second? I second. All right, it's been moved and properly seconded that we enter an executive closed session. Madam Clerk, will you please call, uh, well, Madam Clerk, will you please read the resolution? Yes. Move that the members of the school board go into a closed session for the purposes which are set out in subsection A of section 2.2-3711 of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act as amended for discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of the school board of the city of Norfolk pursuant to subsection, subsection 2.2-3711A1 of the act. The subjects of this portion of the session are the personnel on today's regular personnel agenda and a separate personnel matter concerning an employee complaint. B, discussion of the terms or scope of a public contract, including a possible modification to it, pursuant to subsection 2.2-3711A229 of the Act. The subject of this portion of the session is a possible modification to the contract for governor's training between the school board and the Valvin Group. C, consultation with legal counsel and briefing by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where discussion in open session would adversely affect the school board's negotiating or litigating posture and consultation with legal counsel regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by counsel pursuant to subsections 2.2-3711A7 and 8 of the Act. The subjects of this portion of the session are those set out above in subsections A and B of this motion for consultation with legal counsel as needed. All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Basine? Aye. Hampson? Aye. Gabriel? Aye. Jordan? Aye. Martin? Aye. Ralston? Aye. Clanton? Aye. Right, we'll go ahead and uh, enter an executive closed session and uh, see everyone back. Uh, we're going to come back to order. Do I have a motion to uh, certify the executive closed session? I move to certify the executive closed session. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved and properly seconded that we certify the executive closed session. Madam Clerk, will you please read the resolution? Yes. <clears throat> a resolution certifying an executive meeting of the school board of the city of Norfolk in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, whereas the school board of the city of Norfolk has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, whereas section 2.2-3712 of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the school board of the city of Norfolk that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the school board of the city of Norfolk hereby certifies that, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the executive meeting to which this certification resolution applies, and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the executive meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the school board of the city of Norfolk. Basine? Aye. Hampson? Aye. Gabriel? Aye. Jordan? Aye. Martin? Aye. Rousen? Aye. Clanton? Aye. Right. Motion carries. Um, colleagues, before we move into the next session, we're going to go and take the photo right quick um, for welcoming our students back. So we're going to get on the red carpet. Everybody got your sign? <laughs> All right. It's appropriate to have their picture. Dr. Hersong, if you'll <laughs> join us. Could I be in the back oh, row? Yeah. Okay. Gladly. I mean, I'm going to be With the sign? With sign. Okay. So every year, the SBA does, um, they encourage the school boards to welcome our students back. So we're going to take a photo.
sorry, that would be. It's okay. It's me. You can leave it back. Yeah, leave it on. Good. All right, so while the podium's getting placed back in the position there, um, we have an amendment to the agenda to add item 3.07, the um, <coughs> contract with the amendment to the Balvin Group. Um, I move that we approve the agenda. Or well, yeah, I just I want to add that. Is there any objection to adding the item for the vote? No, I, I would say that I wasn't sure I know in the past we've come out and addressed, approved the draft agenda, and I knew we didn't have that on this it was one. That's why I'm doing it now. This okay, amendment. so this is part of that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I think that, uh, well, I don't have any objection to what you're, what you're adding, okay. but when we get to the point about adopting the, the agenda, I do have a... Okay. What would you like to add? Well, I still think that we should have, um, that our policy allows for... Uh, public comment on agenda and non-agenda items. Mm -hmm. And I, I still think we should have a conversation about uh, if we're gonna suspend the policy or amend the policy, then I think the board should vote on that. And uh, so right now I think we are outside of, um, of, our, of our policy. So I raised that at the last meeting and I just wanna raise that. Again. I'm not so, clear what he has. No, he's saying that we we're have outside of our, our, policy. our policy. Our policy says that for uh, uh, community participation with the board. For when we that, have speakers. That we, that we have, um, that we will provide opportunity for comment on agenda and non-agenda items or, or concerns. Right. So at the last meeting, we were actually voting on uh, approving the, the agenda, but we never voted on changing the policy as it related to citizens' participation in our meetings. So I'm saying that if we're if we are suspending that, then I think the board should have on the agenda the suspension of that policy or the changing of that policy. I don't. In order for us to do that, that it that it doesn't belong simply as part of the agenda planning process because the agenda planning process, in my view, does not. Um, override board policy. But and how so is the being, policy um, different? I'm sorry no, go ahead, to interrupt. Doc. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Ms. Campson. I'm not clear how we always have it at, at meeting, at our meetings, our business meetings, we always have the opening for anyone to come in and sign up and, and speak to us. So we're still doing that. Not right? doing that. Well, I mean, we're not doing it this month because we have no business meeting. Everyone knows that. But uh, Normally we do it. We did. We did it last month. We had a speaker, so I'm not. I'm not understanding because I'm seeing all these letters come in too. Mm -hmm. Why are we getting letters when we're still going to have them speaking? Uh, if if we're doing part of it, if we're doing the agenda items before we vote on the agenda, that makes sense. And if we move the rest of it to the end so that all those people that are done can go home, then why is that different? Yeah. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'll have the final word on it. Go ahead. Um, so uh, I'm sorry. And were you were you done with your yes, comments? Yes, Okay. Um, so I I do agree uh, with what Mr. Jordan is saying, and I guess today I was under the impression that it was a hybrid. It is a hybrid work meeting. session yes. business meeting. So I was also expecting that there would be that opportunity for public comment um, today as well. So um, oh, I, I'm I'm just. So. This is our word of the work so, session, isn't it? So, yeah. So today is a hybrid meeting. Speakers. It's a meeting combining a work session and business. There are some items that we do need to take business on. Um, but I do want to address the item in regards to, it is also policy um, in regards to the board policy that, did, that states that the chair, along with the vice chair and the superintendent, which I stated at the last meeting, creates the agenda. Um, and so that we've had the same discussion, you know, it's difference of opinion in regards to where public um, agenda item and non-agenda items um, are placed on the agenda. Um, we look at this agenda today. We're running behind um, and we need to be able to take care of the, uh, the items that we need to do and some other things we have to do back in closed session. Um, there are many different and I've had conversations with our attorney regarding um, what protects the First Amendment right for communication. Um, and to be very clear, 
what is comment of the community in the public or public comment to the board in that respect. Um, there are many different ways for which public comment can be provided to this board. Uh, many of individuals have uh, exercised that through email. We even have an online tool. The only to, uh, to insinuate that three minutes at a podium is the only way that the public can provide comment to this board is incorrect. And so it is the determination of the board when we vote on the, the agenda to make that determination regarding the things that we need to get done and what that agenda looks like for that day. So I had actually planned um, to make some comments regarding um, that um, because there's been a lot of misinformation in my opinion regarding um, what we talked about public comment. And really invoking the words of Martin Luther King, he says, you know, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. And so I want to shed a little light on that. I clearly stated um, at our last meeting that we would return to non-agenda items in the month of September. That we had so much on our plate for the month of July and August that we needed to focus. We needed to put the focus on our students. We have a strategic plan. I've added additional time in there based on the feedback from our, my colleagues so that we can have the work session. There's a lot of work that we got to get done. And we have to ensure that we're putting and making the main thing the main thing focused on students. So I don't have any problem with people providing comments and, uh, or criticizing, whatever it may be. Nobody's running from that, okay? But I am, in this particular role, taking it very seriously in regards to making sure that we have an agenda that we can make sure that the work is getting done. Our community, our staff members, our kids demand for us to take action and to get work done. And if people don't like that, I'm sorry. I'm not here for likes. I'm here to get the work done, as all of us are. But Mr. Jordan, I disagree with you in the respect in regards to who develops the policy um, and also in regards to where we have a public comment. We have that, but it's also this board's decision when they take a vote um, to approve this agenda, what that agenda looks like. We make it, the board has the, the, the will of the majority as to what that agenda will look like. And so with that, we have so many things um, that we need to do. Um, I'm going to proceed with the vote on the agenda as it's presented with the amendment. Well, Madam Clerk, call the roll. I have an opportunity to respond. Not at this particular point in time. Well, I, I, Madam I, Clerk, please call the roll. Appeal the ruling of the chair. Well, uh, the, the chair overrules your appeal. Call the um, co um, call the um, roll. Sure. I'm voting no because I had an additional item that I wanted to have pulled from the consent agenda, which is the minutes for uh, July 20th. Um, and there was just a correction. That okay, I had. without objection, we'll remove that and move it to an item. Next. Aye. Gabriel. Aye. Uh, I'm voting nay. Again, the uh, authority for the agenda rests with the board as a whole. And so if we're going to make those types of adjustments, I'm not against anything that's been said about getting work done, but it's the board as a whole that gets to make that determination, not, not an individual or the agenda planning team. And so while we're voting, your vote is? I voted no. Okay, next. Um, I just, I don't like being in this situation. Um, I do believe we need to have public comment, um, but I will vote in favor of, of the agenda. All right, thank you. Next. Aye. 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 All right, the mo motion has been approved in regards to the amendment of the agenda, and um, we are pulling out the minutes, and we will add that as an item 3.08. Um, and that was which month, um, Ms. Basine? It was July 20th. July 20th. Yeah. Got it. All right. So we're going to... Um, now go on to the next item, and I think we've got Dr. Pohl um, on the MPS strategic plan continuing the drive, a monitoring calendar, uh, Dr. Bursong. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Clinton, Vice Chair Dr. Gabriel, members of the board, Dr. Bursong. Uh, this afternoon, my first presentation was really just a review of the draft data monitoring calendar. And then I also would like to spend a couple minutes sharing um, the draft strategic plan data um, charts that were presented as well or uploaded as well. So with the monitoring calendar, uh, we've met across departments and talked about when the data comes in because that's what's important. And you'll notice two aspects to this draft monitoring calendar. 
there are um, the data points in each month, and then there are the measures that the data points will hit. And you'll also see um, areas around, let's say, interim data. And these are data points that as a board you've been accustomed to receiving over the past couple of years that we want to make sure that you still receive. So this isn't a strategic plan only data monitoring calendar, but it's data monitoring that you can expect to see through the year for some progress monitoring as well as strategic planning data. So you'll see in July um, the professional development. There will be a report on professional development that matches with workforce um, measure seven. And then you'll see uh, similar to what we did this year, which is the academic state of schools. So a presentation around S preliminary SOL scores, the PALS data and STAR data. In August, um, we'll be presenting the early hires report for the past July because one of the uh, target measures is, is having early hires by July 1. Um, so that matches workforce measure five. Then the advisory committee um, uh, report around memberships on the advisory committees. That'll be uh, measures five and six for safety and climate. MTSS activities will also be presented those. And these data points will be for the previous year, um, the culminating data of, of where those, where those uh, finalized. And then, sorry, here we go. Um, you'll see in September, you know, going down the line, the advanced coursework um, assessment data, gifted enrollment, IB graduation, and community engagement reports. Um, and you'll see exactly where they match up. So if you're not sure, um, like the advanced courseware and assessment, if you go to the student excellence measure five, you'll see that that's uh, tied to the students passing advanced placement, which is a three or higher. Um, or passing an IB um, assessment or being successful in a dual enrollment class, which is a C or higher. Um, so you can see that they all match um, directly to the 42 different measures that are outlined in the draft strategic plan. So then quarter two um, in October, um, pending, it's always going to be pending the state, but October is usually a comfortable time frame where the school accreditation data is finalized, um, which would also include our CCCRI data. Um, the final SOL outcomes will be able to finalize uh, the staffing reports as well, which you can see will cover several different measures in that staffing report. The chronic absenteeism will be finalized as well as the discipline for the year before. November, um, we'll be able to do the fall SOL growth assessment data. So we'll start reporting on that next year. As you know, this coming year is the second year of that growth assessment. Uh, the through test is what it's called. So we'll have a fall a winter um, through test leading up to the uh, spring SOL tests. We'll also then have a finalized promotion retention report. Our enrollment report, which is usually in November, will include more in-depth demographics to cover the different measures. Um, and we'll um, include also the specialty programs uh, enrollment because that's a measure that we're looking at as well. Um, the, and then the interim data there is the fall star data. And then the on-time graduation will be finalized by, by then as well. December is all interim data. It's our quarter one grades, the chronic absenteeism report like we have traditionally done this year, and then the fall PALS data. And you'll see as we get to quarters three and four, there's less data because most of the strategic planning data has been um, uploaded by that point. So by January, we'll have PSAT participation because as you know, the PSAT is in October. Um, We'll have the post-secondary enrollment, employment, and enlistment report, and that's something new that we have to work on developing um, to uh, survey our postgraduates and uh, try to, try to uh, um, glean that data in the best way possible so that we can know that we're growing in those areas. And then we'll have our grades and chronic absenteeism, kindergarten readiness. This seems late, and I had to question this one because it's February, but the window for the VKRP is open until December. So we just won't have the data until that point to be able to report it, but that'll be for the fall current year kindergarten readiness. Then you'll see the mid-year SOL growth assessment and the winter star. And then in quarter four um, in May, we'll do the, the grades and chronic absenteeism as well. So this is our <coughs> draft calendar of when you can expect data reports. Some will be presentations, some will be reports, um, you know, depending on time limits of board meetings. Um, to be able to, to share this information with you. And then we did take the time to create a draft um, data monitoring table. Um, and this is pretty extensive. Uh, tried to 
make it as, as easy as possible to, to click, make it clickable. Um, the data table titles uh, align to the different measures. So under student excellence, we have 14 measures. So you can see the first 14 tables. They align directly to what those measures are. On the right, these are page numbers. Um, and if you click, let's say we wanted to know specifically the reading SOL scores. If you click on table seven, because I do remember last time I did a large PDF, I think there was a request to make it a little bit more accessible. You can see it takes you right to the reading SOL tests. And then as an added bonus, if you go to the bottom of the page, click there, it's gonna take you right back to the top. So you can get right back to the table of contents to make it a little bit easier to navigate. And the other thing about this is this will also drive the development of our website. So one of the things we've really talked heavily about, uh, specifically at the Summer Leadership Institute, is data transparency and making sure our community has the data in a readable way, um, an understandable way. Um, and the other thing I want to point out on this, I'm not, please, if you'd like me to, I'm happy to, but I wasn't planning on going through every 42 table, every oh. one of the tables tonight. We can read. Um, so, <laughs> as, Maybe we need a table so we would know if, if the board was able to do that. As we, as we go through the, the data that comes in this year and as we start presenting those, those data points, which are kind of our baseline from 21-22 for the most part, will develop the SMART goals that have been already pre-written in here. So you'll see a lot of XX percents in here. It's because that's where we get the goal. And you see on the right-hand side, we have a target area where we want to reach. So we want to know what that target is when we complete our strategic plan so that we know that we're going towards that target and making it. And there's only one in here that I completed, and that is for accreditation we did put 100%. Because the goal is to be 100% accredited, <laughs> yes, right? Good. So we have that in here already. Um, but the, the goal of this work here is as we progress through gathering data that's baseline from last year and the initial data from this year, and some of the data we won't know until next year because some of the data, like with principal advisory committees and students and teachers on it, that's really being implemented this year. So that data will come in in the fall of next year to, to start with the baseline. But it's an area where we know we want to grow because it gives us more feedback as a division from different groups of, 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 our, of our stakeholders. Um, so with that, I just wanted to open it up for any questions or comments you may have. Um, if you, you know, directionally, if you think this is way off, I'd, I'd love to know that as well, but just some feedback in general. <laughs> All right, so let's just go around the circle. How does that work? Ms. Basine? If you want to start that way. Okay, that would be, <laughs> that, one. And, that would be and, fair. That would be I, fair because yeah. I would start on that side yeah. there. Um, and again, um, with respect to time, everybody at least two questions first. Let's get everybody around and then we'll come back. Mr. Jordan. Yeah, uh, just a couple of things. Um, one, I was glad to hear about the, the data transparency. I made a note about dashboards. So I hope we, I encourage you to definitely move forward in, in on that respect. Um, on the table and on the monitoring calendar, I would recommend um, putting some type of uh, indicator so that we would have a sense of which data is lead data and which data is lag data. Uh, I think that would that would be Say helpful. that again, Mr. Jordan, I'm sorry. Which data is what's lead data and what's lag data. Okay. So that we have a sense of what we're what we're looking at. We know that some data is from past, other data that may be giving us an indication of moving forward what it's what it's indicating to us. And it's not a just a real quick one. Uh, can you just, just um, spell through when you said through report how is that spelled t-h-r-u-g-h uh, -H. -H yes yeah, it's, it's literally like going through the year okay thank you they keep changing the name <laughs> they do uh, it, oh. it keeps changing okay thank you yeah and we just uh, you know we really just landed on calling it the um growth assessment because yeah. that's truly what it is it's it's going to show us the growth from the fall to the spring so, so we get fall winter and through report and growth assessment are the same, same thing, thing. Okay. okay thank you no problem my pleasure uh, you're I'm, I'm probably just as confused as you are on that mr jordan <laughs> In all fairness. Um, okay. I love this. Um, thank you for all of this organization and also having this as the basis for the website and, and being more transparent in our, um, in our communication to the public moving forward because I am confident that we are going to have a lot of bragging to do and we want to make sure that the bragging is done well. <laughs> so, um, so thank you. Uh, I, otherwise, I really don't have anything to add, but I, I'm just really impressed that, um, you know, 
you guys continue to listen to us and, and continue to deliver. So thank you. My pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank you. I don't really have any questions except this is good work and just continue it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to echo the comments of my colleagues because this is very clean. It's simple. It's, it's easy to follow. Uh, and I think that as you work towards truly making it um, not just transparent, but as you said, very easy for the public to read and, and follow through, that, that's going to be very critical because we want them to see the successes that we're going to be accomplishing over the many years as we hit those targets and hopefully surpass them. My question is when we do the presentations that may be associated with some of the reports, how do you see yourself taking the board from this is where we were, this is where we are, and, and we either hit this point or didn't make this point, and this is the course correction that we're making so that way we stay on target? Because at the end of the day, that's what I'm interested in. I, I, I like seeing the data, but data is data unless we're doing something with it. I know you guys are really into that when your, your data meetings that you have. Um, so tell me how you're going to lead the board in those discussions. Absolutely. So I, I think, you know, what we've started to do over the past couple of years are making sure that we add slides about in implications of the data. Um, so if, if the data is not moving where we think it needs to move, you know, what are we going to do different? Like, case in point with science. When we did the preliminary report with science, we had three slides on science alone. Mm -hmm. Reading and math only had one slide each because we saw a movement that we want to see, so we want to continue that type of growth. Science wasn't where we wanted it to, so there were some more implications of the data. And I think as we go through these data points, same thing. You know, but now we have 42 different data points we're looking at at this point right now. But when we present on it, whether it be a written report to the board or an oral report, your presentation in front of the board, there will always be implications to the data, um, whether it's a chance to pat ourselves on the back or to motiv motivate ourselves to, to really push forward, to make it clear with the board and the public, though, that, that it's not just, oh, we got the data, better luck next year. I, I don't feel that we do that. I feel like we're pushing yeah. hard and we're planning hard and we're very, very systematic in what we're putting in place as a, as a team, as a leadership team, all the way down to teachers bus drivers, uh, you know, everybody um, is involved. So we'll try to continue to share that. And, and one of the things is, you know, continue to ask, I'm, I'm, I really, I'm gonna probably hit myself when I say it, but continue to ask the questions, right? Because the questions drive the change. So they're important. Thank you. Hampson? Well, I'll just add to what everyone else is saying. This is super great um, to, to see that, we're, that we actually are this is the best I've seen in a long time of putting the, the data together in a, book, in a booklet format so that you can continually see from year to year how you're for the classroom teacher and the principals in the building so they can see the movement as they go. Um, I hope that, and I'm sure we will be seeing a lot of, of more data analysis training for our teachers and our principals um, because this is step one, as we know, we got our data together. And I know from personal experience, you could spend a year getting your data together, and if you don't do anything with it, it looks good, but you don't make any difference. I think a good example is a couple of incidences um, where, where children were, and now they're allowed to retest on the SOL. And what happened between their not passing the SOL and their opportunity to retest. And I know that their parents, um, that we're concerned about that not happening. What's the point of having the data here and you've got till next week? If it's only a week, if, if, if a teacher has that data, she knows what to do with that week. And so that's the thing, and I'm sure that's what y'all are working on and have been working on, is to make sure because what made the difference for Norfolk Public Schools 20 years ago was that we were deeply trained and to what we were doing with the data, and that's why you saw the credulations go through the ceiling, and that's what we want to focus on. And this is certainly the whole foundation that's going to stand on. So I'm excited. Whoa, <laughs> ready for the next school year. <laughs> is there another opening in the classroom? Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm about to do At third Jay grade Cox, again. Uh, yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> this is just where I think all seven of us. Mm -hmm. wanted to go with what we now see as the foundation. We just need to make sure, because I do remember 20 years ago, there were some principals that were not buying into it, 
and you start to see that after a year or two. Well, so. I think you'll be, sorry, you had your pen up first. If I may, um, <laughs> and, and I'll Paul ask uh, first. <laughs> Dr. Pohl to, to respond to this. So we appreciate that comment. Um, for the last couple of days, we've been engaged with our Summer Leadership Institute and Mount, wow, what a wonderful, wonderful experience it was. And everybody is energized. Our principals are energized and ready to go. But we talked about data dip, data driven decision making decision making is right, data driven decision sometimes. making and we have we talked about plans for next year and expectations and how we're all going to hold ourselves accountable for the work each and every one of us so dr pohl if you would please just share the tidbits from the last couple of days on what we've done to create that foundation for rigorous Absolutely. work as it relates to data driven decision making and actually action looking at data and making decisions based on the data and moving forward especially mike schmoker was at our conference Ooh. so we Ford are like invited. more excited than ever so no, absolutely Pope. and that's exactly where i was going to go is that you'd, you'd really be pleased to know as a, as a board some of the work that was done over the past couple of days and one of the specific mandatory sessions was around data um, and our, our wonderful ARI department came in with specific school folders, not just here's general data and how you do it, but here is your school's preliminary data and here's how we're gonna walk through this together. Um, as well, last year through the data meetings that we, that we uh, started that will continue this year, um, I know ARA had a couple teams that went to some schools um, and did data presentations specifically with the leadership teams and with faculty members um, for that exact reason. And now principals are already knocking on the door or emailing to have those done earlier this year. So a lot of the excitement is right. what the foundation that was built last year around data, the principals and the, and the teachers are actually excited about it this year because it's earlier. Mm -hmm. So the data, and you'll hear a little bit in the return of school presentation, but the data from you know, the Lexia Core 5 program for reading, you know, that's gonna start much earlier this year because it's already in. The teachers know how to use it, the professional developments have been done, students are already online. Um, the um, Edmentum um, math software, same thing. <coughs> so these data pieces go to the classroom level where the expectation is that teachers are looking at it. And the expectation I think has been solidified that the principals really work with their data and work with their school teams to move, move it forward. Because you'll hear, I think, um, from, from at least one, if not both of our principals tonight, some of the work they did on data and, and where they landed data-wise. And, and you guys saw the presentation in July that some some steep gains with with our data this year because of that focus because you're absolutely right miss camps and that focus on data is what's going to create the change mm -hmm. and the focus on personal accountability right. it's the adults that. in the building who need to be looking in the mirror right. when the data comes in either to do a dance a jig or to go cry right. and <laughs> i've been in the go cry group <laughs> and, to, and, to, and to follow up i want to be in the good on the crying anymore and, and to follow up you know when dr birdsong did the opening and it was around data and the excitement of the room was, was wonderful, but the other thing is, 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 you know, the introduction of the strategic plan happened, and that was the other mandatory session, and Dr. Birdsong's exact comment. And because they all go together. Right. Well, her exact comment was around, we're all accountable for all of these measures. Mm. It's not a board thing. It's not a superintendent thing or an ELT thing. Everybody's accountable for these measures. <coughs> so the other mandatory session, they had to sit and listen to me, the poor souls, um, for a oh. session on strategic okay. planning and on the measures and dig into the measures and what it meant for their school and how does that connect to their cna and how does that connect to their school improvement plans in their data meetings and how does all this come together absolutely data is our first Good job yeah i'll clap for that <clears throat> well I, you know thank you very much for this um, information and i echo the sentiments that my colleagues have put forward already um, you know obviously this is one of the things that i've been looking forward to you know receiving so that it could guide our work and, and agenda planning and and just so that we know what will what we're going to be reviewing next um, i also like that it's uh, very student outcomes focused and you can see that in every agenda so uh, or every you know in the calendar every month um, i do have a couple of questions so as you mentioned already we'll be receiving some of this information via report via presentation you know maybe different um, um, I do I do have appreciated over the years you know receiving the reports but oftentimes in the reports there are highlights um, and possible actions that may need to be taken that sometimes 
um, we don't always, you know, kind of come back to discuss. Um, and so that's one thing I think just to be a little, uh, a little more intentional as a board, I mean, not really administration because they're providing us with the feedback, with the report. So I think for the board, I think it's important that we're intentional about, um, you know, coming back to some of uh, those key actions that may be gleaned from the reports that we received. Um, the other thing uh, is, you know, there are programs like Open Campus, for instance, um, that how we might uh, discuss topics, uh, you know, and programs that we have like Open Campus or Overage for Grade Students, you know, like how that may be integrated into some of the, the areas, uh, you know, in this monitoring calendar. Uh, so that's just something for us to think about. Is that um, a question? to Dr. Pohl, um, how we're integrating? Well, he may not have the answer to that right now, so I'm just saying as a comment, I'm putting okay, that out there that okay. when we come back to this, because I, I take this as a draft because the strategic plan is also a draft at this point. So, you know, when the measures are kind of fine-tuned and, you know, that that we're able to come back to this and- The living document. It's, yeah, so, so I'm just, right now, I'm just providing that mm. feedback if you have an answer to that, then certainly, you know, but I don't want to put you on the spot either. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I do, one of the measures is around programs. And I think, you know, generally we focus on our academic programs, you, you know, like our um, the IB program or the, the art, you know, arts program, um, health sciences, you know, I could list them all. You know, if, if we wanted to collect data on that, we could also talk about you know, open campus, and we can talk about, you know, different programs, you know, if that's something that we, that we felt is an important measure that comes out of the discussions, the, it, 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 it could fit there. I'm just, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and speaking of measures to your question, for, for example, today, we graduated 80 uh, students. Know. Yeah, right. From, you know, during today's graduation mm -hmm. right. ceremony, and 20 of those children were uh, enrolled at Open Campus. Right. So yeah. that's a data point that I can share with yeah. the board, something to celebrate. Absolutely. So you will also yeah. see that data within our graduation data that we mm -hmm. provide to the board as right. well. And that's a great example of like the integrated, you know, piece, but knowing specifically you know, because that is a program, you know, how that program is doing, are we meeting the goals of the program, the objectives, you know, all of that, like, just to put specific and intentional um, uh, attention to that, I think is important. Um, the other, the other thing, just as you do with your, it sounds like the Summer Leadership Institute was amazing. I saw, you know, several, uh, you know, social media posts from teachers and principals, you know, just saying how useful they felt it was. And I think that, I think it'd be useful for the board as well, um, that, you know, it's great when we get data presentations, but, you know, over the years, I know board members have had different levels of understanding of the data sometimes, you know, or we might have different expectations of what kind of data we want to receive or different levels of understanding of what the data is telling us. So I think if we also have some professional development around um, what the data is telling us, you know, and, and using that, you know, the data made me do it, which is one of the, was a workshop that the board did several years ago, which I thought was really useful. And, you know, all the board members were on the same page about how to interpret and um, look at the data that is provided by the administration. So just for us as a board to kind of put a pin in that as uh, something that we could do. Um, I'd like to see that. And last, so I noticed, and I know this is a living document, a draft, but like April, you know, June, um, you know, I think, I think we're still working on what, what may be covered during those months. But I also think it would be great if we could be intentional about having retreats, like a mid-year and, and a summer retreat, so that we can really do a deep dive, deep dive meaning not getting into the weeds, but I mean being really being able to see that we are covering, you know, all of the things that are in these charts in a meaningful way, um, and so that we can plan for the upcoming year. Um, so I'm taking away um, from you, Ms. Bassine. 
uh, that we add in some professional development for the board, maybe like the data make me do it, and also looking at our calendar, a mid-year, and a, a, adding a mid-year to our normal retreat. Is that what I'm hearing also? Correct. Okay. Yes. I like that idea. Yeah. And so that we all know, it's not a surprise, it's in the calendar that in January, you know, we do a retreat, like an all-day retreat that kind of, And a know, better use of the time that we have yeah. is that we're getting a deep dive knowing exactly what's going on with the guidance of the experts, right. which is not how, a much wiser way to use the retreats. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So just, you know, that's yeah. some feedback. Great. But. So, I, I mean, um, just kind of rounding out that first round, and then if anybody has anything, I know we've got a little bit of time here, but we're going to catch up. Um, I, um, I agree um, with the sentiments of my, uh, my, my colleagues, um, making sure that we can make this very plain to not just our internal um, customers and in respect of our, our staff and teachers, but also to our parents and the community, so that they have a clear understanding of where we're going. And I appreciate the work that's gone in this. Um, as it's been stated, this is a living document. Um, and we're, we're working on what those targets will be. Um, but I, I think the measurements, and I know that the, the board, we spent um, a considerable amount of time, um, and you know others considered um, and provided some additional feedback um, that, we'll, that the administration will take under consideration. But um, I appreciate this process of going through so that we're a part of this process and, and providing that. Um, and so with that, I'll kind of open it back up if there's any final thing on that one I want to try to catch up on some time that we lost here Ms. Bessine I know that Mr. Jordan did go ahead did you have something else too? No 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 okay. sorry go ahead, Mr. Jordan. Uh, just one additional uh, comment on the um, the years that we're looking at as far as the chart is concerned so I, I think we should consider strongly having a pre-pandemic year so that the charts start with uh, 2021 2022 which to me is uh, um, kind of come back from the pandemic year, or at least return back to in-person learning. And what uh, a lot of the state discussion, local discuss discussion, national discussion centers around uh, trying to make sure that we can quantify and qualify the impact of the pandemic. And then um, and when I'm saying that, because I know we're still in it, but I mean, in terms of virtual learning to in-person learning um being able to capture that and um monitoring our progress so that we can see uh if we start off already exceeding pre-pandemic data are we still lagging somewhat behind pre-pandemic data so i don't need it to necessarily be treated as your baseline data but i do think having a chart a line a column there that shows the pre-pandemic data allows for, at least the, from the board and whatever you all decide to do on the administration side, but I think from our perspective, to be able to uh, make sure that we can provide um, feedback and support in terms of how our children were doing pre-pandemic and how they're doing now as we work to address uh, continuous learning. So uh, just to clarify, would you suggest, I guess, like the state's doing use 18 19 data because yeah. that was the last full year mm -hmm. um, I agree with that. and then with also with an understanding that clearly some of the data points we won't have because they they right. we still don't even have for this year yeah. right okay right. yeah i understand some will be in a some may be have asterisks behind it but i think it's important that we that we monitor that okay so i just want to because i just want to make sure that we have clarity and we give you clear direction so is there any objection to what mr jordan is asking the administration to add did you have a comment Not an on that objection, to Just a, a, a elaboration. Okay. So it seems like what you're saying is that we could have a chart here, not all these, we need a baseline date. That's where you start with your baseline on a strategic plan. So uh, another chart that goes back and takes that starting with, with the 17, 18 year and lets us look at it on a separate chart, but not to put all that information at the beginning of your baseline. Right. Is that what, well, is that what you're saying, Mr. So, Jordan? Uh, so what I'm so I don't think that we need. I'm, I'm largely focused on uh, student academic performance. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily want to go back and see retention rate of staff pre-pandemic. Want to sit for the academic. But I think data. as it deals with the academic performance of our students, uh, that it would be a column that was there. I think it's we can receive a recommendation whether or not that should be treated as 
baseline data or not. I did not want to try to push that. I'm just simply saying that I think that having that information available to us would be valuable for our evaluation and assessment and the discussions that we have. Okay. I agree with that. Hey, My agree. recommendation, sorry, Mr. Clinton, oh, for that would be, so 27, 28 column and target column are, are the same basically because 27, 28 is the final year and that's where we want to hit it. So if, if the board wanted to do something like that, my recommendation would be to remove the 27, 28 column that becomes your target column anyway and we can shift everything right and add that year of data if that's the board's request. And then what we can do is put a bold line after the 21, 22 years so that we know that this starts our strategic planning um, implementation, oh, which is like those wonderful red lines that was on the data. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We could be looking at what's happening. Is our strategic plan working? Correct. Right. I'm, you know, visually, I'm just trying to make sure. I understand what you're saying, Mr. Jordan, and that, I, you know, I love trend data. So. I know. Yeah. Um, and you did that in your, in the, in the previous <laughs> report correct. you gave us, right. you did that. Correct. So I'm just saying, yeah. kind of continue that, that pattern here. Right. Uh, it's, it's doable. So just so I make sure everybody cool with, with that? Yes. The request? Yes. Okay, cool. Great. Um, okay, Ms. Basin, I think, did you have something else? Or Ms. Jordan, did you have something else? Everybody good? Oh. No, I, I just was going to say I support, support, support that. that. Okay. Yeah. Great. So with that, thank you, Dr. Paul. Yeah. So um, the, the item that we have here, um, just similar to what we did at the uh, last meeting, um, I'm just going to entertain a motion to, um, for the board to signal to the administration that we approve of the direction that they're going in. Again, as we know, this is a living document. And we can definitely come back and make some changes if need be. So do I hear a motion to approve the direction? I move to approve the direction that the superintendent and her team are presenting. All right. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Do I hear a second? Second. All right. It's been moved and properly seconded that we approve the direction that the um, Dr. Birdsong and her team is headed in with this. Um, and is there any discussion? Jordan? Just, just, can you just clarify? So I know at the... <clears throat> Previous meeting, we um, we had a calendar, and we were going to come back and revisit our calendar. Can you just kind of reset for us what, what what the next steps will be? One in terms of the draft feedback that we gave on the on the goals, and then also how we will come back and integrate this recommended calendar into the the board's calendar that we are going to eventually, I think, vote on. Um, so. With all due respect, um, I think I kind of outlined it in the email that I sent to everybody, very detailed on where we were going, starting on the 17th and coming back on the 14th. Um, this specific item for what you're asking, though it might be slightly germane, it's not to this particular motion, um, but I'll be more than happy to detail that out again and further clarify it. But essentially everything is moving to the 14th where we'll come back and review goals. Okay? Just, just for clarity, I, I'm, not, I'm just trying to make sure I understand I support the direction in terms mm -hmm. of the monitoring piece. I just, I'll, I'll go back and reread the email and send you the a response again. But okay. what I was trying to get to is just understanding where given the endorsement of direction in terms of the monitoring calendar approach and the table approach. Mm -hmm. But we also, in doing so, recognize that some of the measures and, and the goals still may are subject yep. to change based Correct. upon that action. And I was just trying to get a sense of yeah. when that act, what the schedule would be towards that action. So I'm just not the answer no, 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 I, 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 I just wanted to clarify what the question sure, was. I don't want this to fill on that one. Um, again, we're monitoring calendar today. We're going to come back on the 17th to talk about vision and, and um, mission statement again because we had uh, there was I think a consensus of the uh, board to revisit that. So the, all these parts are coming together. And as we mentioned before, this document is a living document. So we'll come back and, and make necessary changes. The things that you all have presented as board members to the administration to take under consideration is still in play. We'll come back to that on September 14th and have that initial discussion based on what the administration has brought back to us regarding those things and changes to goals um, and the um, actual objectives. If there's a continuation of the conversation after that, that will follow and sue the next week on the 21st of September. But the objective is, is that we'll be able to, 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 by the 21st of September, be able to, to make some decisions clear on that because that will also detail into the goals and mutually agreed upon goals with the superintendent um, going for the, the remainder of the year and that we'll be able to do evaluation and so forth, okay? Is everybody clear on that? 
call the vote. All right. Any additional discussion? Uh, yes, Ms. Bassin. So, so I and I, I really appreciate your effort to ensure that we're providing clear direction. I do, and and that's just what it is that we are in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But the board has also provided feedback that will yep. be considered. Yep. Um, and you know, tying this to later with the personnel. Uh, I'm not personnel. I'm sorry. The um, Sorry, the school board minutes, you know, so I just think being very clear also because that that was where when we when we do do these motions where it's the direction that we're in agreeing agreement upon, you know, that that we agree upon. I just want to be clear that 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 is also clearly noted that so we are I, agreeing to the direction that we're going in, but it's not necessarily. It is not the, the content, final end all because we haven't. It's not the final vote. On, there will be a final vote right. on the strategic plan. What we're trying to and do is this, a, and, and this and monitoring calendar and all these things associated with is that we as a board have to give clear direction to the administration and, and letting them know that yes, we're we're liking the direction you're going. We're giving you feedback so that we can get to an end goal. Um, but the, having that out there and not giving clear direction to the administration right. leaves a void in there in the respect okay. of the work that they need to do. And we need to if this is what they need, make then, sure that they're okay. using their time wisely and not spinning the wheels. So right. when they come back, okay. they're giving things that we're very clear on. Okay. Okay. Is there any additional discussion? Thank you, Ms. Bassine. All right. Um, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Bassine. Aye. Hampson. Aye. Gabriel. Aye. Jordan. Aye. Martin. Aye. Rousen. Aye. Clanton. Aye. Thank you, Dr. Pohl. Thank you. Um, our next item on the agenda is educational facility planning, Moria High School School Feasibility Study. Mr. Fraley and HBA Architects. Yes. And uh, yes. Dr. Birdsong, if you wanted to. Yes, Mr. Fraley will, will be introducing our consultants. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Mr. Clanton, Dr. Gabriel, uh, Dr. Birdsong, members of the board. This afternoon, we will present to you the Moria Phase Two. Uh, plan. Our guests today are Mike Ross and Jack Hastings from HBA Architecture. Both of these gentlemen are architects and both of them are principal leaders with HBA and they are recognized as industry specialists in K-12 design, K design. Excuse me. They will co-present today and then be available for questions after they complete their presentation. Mr. So Fraley. we should be loading the PowerPoint, not the PDF. Is it the NPS school board presentation? Not the PDF, the, the presentation. PowerPoint. We just provided a PDF and it has a zip drive to it. Which one is it? If you look up here, which one is it? PowerPoint. Come here real quick for us. I didn't have so it. In other words, hand. all my Commodores should be really paying attention to this, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Which one is it? <laughs> all right. Is this Not your flash drive? It's it has, flash drive? Is this the, the title flash drive? Is right Mari. Here? Yes. Hmm? High school feasibility study. Okay, so which mm -hmm. one of these documents is it? I want to load, so he has uh, it on the flash drive. This one here? Okay, got it. There we go. Okay, thank you very much. We're good. Each file. And this is addressable if you guys would like yes. it or lower. Good afternoon, Chairman Clanton, uh, Vice Chair Dr. Gabriel, board members, and uh, Dr. Birdsong. It's our pleasure to be here this afternoon to give you a progress report on the Maury High School Phase Two Modernization versus Replacement Study. Figure out how to advance the slides. There we go. Our outline today is to review where we've been and what has been accomplished so far, and then to discuss recommended next steps. We'll begin with a brief overview of the Maury High School Phase One educational specification process and then work our way through the phases of the modernization versus replacement feasibility study process. So like, is it to point that way? Point it that way. Ah, uh, helps to turn it on, huh? Mm-hmm. There we go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Mm. 
So our firm, HBA, along with Cooperative Strategies, commenced the educational specification process in early 2018. We facilitated a highly collaborative planning process that included physical and virtual tours of exemplary, exemplary facilities. We interviewed EVMS staff partners for the um, Health and Medical Sciences Academy. And we also conducted three planning labs with stakeholders that included uh, teachers, parents, students, community members, and also conducted three community engagement meetings. The goal of the educational sp uh, specification process was to define what learning should look like and then to plan flexible and adaptable spaces to support the desired learning outcomes. We started our journey by focusing on Mari High School's slogan, Mari High School students have class, or Commodores learn by asking, showing, and sharing, which exemplifies an active and inquiry-based learning approach. The community helped us understand the strengths and weaknesses of the current educational program, and they also helped us to identify potential obstacles to success and also identify prospects for improvements to the facility. And these are, these are excerpted pages from the EdSpec document that I'm, I'm showing you now. The work of the stakeholder planning labs and community engagements led to the development of nine design principles for future Maury High School learning environments. And I'm going to just briefly touch on these. Our reimagined Maury High School will build on traditional tradition. It will be timeless, but also focus on the future. It will provide small learning communities where each student can know each other and also their teachers and support groups. Our reimagined Maury High School will be flexible and adaptable to accommodate real-time space reconfiguration for active learning and to accommodate space changes needed for future educational programs. It will facilitate anytime, anywhere learning and it will also be safe and secure environment. Our reimagined Maury High School will be sustainable. It will provide space for community. <coughs> and last but not least, it will respect the community context. The work of the stakeholder planning labs also led to the development of a space allocation program which envisioned serving approximately 889 students in about 320,000 plus or minus square feet, including the natatorium. And this is the summary of, of that program that was included in the report. Our collaboration work also led to the articulation of common design attributes that should be incorporated into a reimagined Maury High School, such as smaller learning communities, commons as a hub of the school, and natural light in all learning spaces, to name just a few of the more important. And this takes us to our overview of what has been accomplished so far in the phase two modernization versus replacement study. And I want to start just by uh, articulating what the scope was as defined by the RFP. We were supposed to, we were tasked with providing a detailed recommendation to the Snuffer School Board on the future of Moore High School's building, either to renovate the existing structure, possibly in phases, or con construct a new high school building. Our analysis was to include estimated costs and also address issue issues related to each alternative. And we were to use the completed educational specifications document, which we developed a few years prior, as basis for laying out the facility's educational spaces to support the future needs of the high school students. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jack, and he's going to take you through the information gathering phase of our study. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I enjoyed Dr. Pohl's description of how data was incorporated into the discussion he just had, because just like his efforts, our efforts relied heavily on data gathering, and also how, how we interpret that data and how we actually measure it. And those terms were used in, the, in that discussion as well. Um, so just like this aerial site, the items that we're going to talk about today are very high level. There's a lot of content in the report, and the idea is to give you kind of the executive summary. So we're touching on the highlights. There's a tremendous amount of data that backs up what you're going to be given in this brief, um, brief overview. So you think of Maury High School as one singular building, but actually in order for us to evaluate it properly, there's actually five buildings within the 
existing building, and they range in age from 1911 all the way through the late 1980s. So in order for us to make our assessment of the existing building, we had to treat each one of those areas as separate building assessments. In the next slide, we, um, which is um, not intended for everybody to read, but it's in information that you all have. This is a summary sheet of the work that was involved with uh, a large group of architects and engineers going through Maury High School. And the five columns that are on the far left actually represent the birth dates for each one of those five building areas that we talked about. Um, we're able to give them a score, measure how they deal with each other. Uh, and then also um, the formula provides data about what it costs to maintain a building. So the far right is, is the uh, statement that indicates there's no educational improvements, no facility improvements. For the next 25 years, it'll cost the division $76 million just to maintain what's there uh, without any improvements. Um, so the highlights of the building assessment um, really focused on water and how it infiltrates Maury and its degrading effects on the building itself. There's five bullets on the far left-hand side. Four of those deal with water infiltration issues that we've dealt with in the report to um, determine impact with respect to the facility assessment. Um, for those of you that are familiar with Maury, there is a projecting cornice, which has been temporarily supported probably for over 10 years. And um, that's just a sketch of that condition and how, it'd be, how the restoration effort would approach that element. So the, the, wa the exterior walls are what we call composite wall assemblies that due to the water infiltration, this is just one example of a plaster interior wall where plaster has been impacted by water infiltration that occurs throughout the school. One of the aspects that we thought it was important to evaluate was to bring on an expert. That expert is Commonwealth Preservation Group. They have specific experience in historic um, rehabilitation credit, tax credits. So um, we brought them on board and they gave us valuable imp input to the project. Um, the first thing is that they, they indicated that in 1996, it was noted that Maury was in fact eligible to be placed on the, on the register for Virginia. Um, if the city of Norfolk determines and Norfolk Public Schools determines that that's a viable approach, um, it would only be limited to three parts of the building, and that is the 1911 building, 29, and the 1955 building. And only 20, up to 25% of the cost to, to renovate that work could be attributed to the tax credit. Maury, if you're interested in federal tax credits, because Maury High School is not an income producing facility, because of that reason, it's not eligible for federal tax credits. Three things that came to mind with respect to the input they, they gave us, the consultant gave us. There are historic features that need to be retained. They include the uh, glazed terracotta trim pieces that are throughout the building exterior. Uh, if windows are to be replaced, they're to be in the same profile as they were in 1911, which it was a single wood, uh, single hung wood window assembly. Uh, they thought it was important that we retain historic interior features such as circulation corridors and existing stairwells. And, and lastly, with respect to the building volume, the idea is they really wanted to preserve the exterior. They, did, they felt like any additions, if, if they were considered, needed to be within or internal to the building so it doesn't impact the existing appearance of the building. So. Um, we want to be reasonable and conservative with respect to how we understand that data. So we think it's reasonable to assume that after we go through the process that 50% of the number that they were saying could be used as a tax credit for either of the two options that Mike will show you later um, would come up with a credit of about $7 million on average between the two uh, renovation options. But Thinking about the process, dealing with the consultant, we really think if we were to explore that, it would be, take about a year from a schedule span, standpoint just to deal with that issue. 
So based on the way everybody knows about building cost, uh, labor availability, material availability, we think that um, that tax credit would be eaten up in one year's escalation. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a finding that was important. Okay. Thanks, Jack. So our next step in the process process was to develop conceptual designs based on the ed specs. We developed two modernization options and we developed two replacement options. And then we evaluated each option based on certain feasibility factors. And once again, this was a data-driven process. So we, we evaluated each design concept on how well it, it accommodated the educational program, on how well it accommodated desired site elements. We evaluated it based on construction phasing, schedule impact, how much it impacted the student learning and also life cycle cost impact. So I'm going to start with option A1, which we, uh, we call learning community infill. The uh, floor area shaded red of this diagram denote areas of major demolition and primarily encompass the areas that you think of as the infill in the building where the library media center is, where the cafeteria is, and also the, the, the locker room areas that are kind of between the original buildings and the gym. So we're proposing to demolish those areas. The primary design um, drivers of this concept were to infill the demolition areas with new educational spaces to create more cohesive learning communities and to push the support spaces such as library, media center, cafeteria, and locker rooms to the outside of the educational learning community envelope to, to make the building more, more efficient. And then our other primary driver was to retain and restore the 1911 and 1929 buildings. So this diagram shows proposed floor plan layouts as mapped from the educational specifications. Each one of these uh, colored areas are different components of the ESPEC. The, um, the blue colors are the learning spaces, the classrooms, the labs. Yellow spaces are common spaces. Red spaces are um, physical education. The, the green spaces are, are administration. This aerial view shows the proposed new construction areas in light blue and also shows where we're proposing to add a new bus loop loading area within the site to get the buses off the street. And for this particular concept, the playing fields remain in their current general location. The construction phasing for this modernization concept is the, the most complex of the four options that we looked at. It would commence with building the auxiliary gym and locker room additions in the back first constructing the new bus loop loading area, and then setting up a, uh, a large group of temporary portable classrooms because we'll need to house between two-thirds and three-fourths of the student population outside the building during the next two years of construction in order to accomplish renovating, completely renovating and restoring the, the existing buildings. Once we have um, displaced the students to the temporary classrooms. We start then renovating the east side of the building, which is classrooms and the auditorium. And that will take about, about another year. And then, oh, sorry. Did I skip a slide? I did. Okay. So in the second year, we're doing the phase two renovations, which is the west side of the 1911, 1929 buildings and the interior where the locker rooms and natatorium is. And in the third year, we are um, renovating the east side of, of the 1911-1929 building, including the auditorium. The next uh, modernization option we looked at, we, we, uh, we called learning community additions for a reason you'll see obvious. Um, so the floor areas denoted in red on this diagram, once again, are showing major demolition. And you can see that we're, we're removing less of the back of the building, but we're remo removing more of what's on the, um, I guess, the west side of the building, including about half of the 1929 uh, building. The primary driver, drivers of this concept were to build enough new learning community space in the first phase so that we would not have to utilize temporary portable classrooms during the rest or remainder of the, the renovation project. And also to re retain and restore as much of the 1911 and 1929 building as possible. So in this, um, in this concept, 
what you're seeing is you're seeing the existing building and then we're creating a probably a three-story commons atrium space that connects the old building to the new classrooms, similar to what they did at Slover Library, connecting the old to the new. And then the, the classroom addition is four stories. The spaces within the black dash line are the existing building, and then we're adding in the back um, new auxiliary gym spaces and, and filling some um, building surfaces spaces. This aerial view shows the composite massing of this particular concept. So you can see we're, we're continuing the, the four-story mass of the existing Moore High School to the east, um, and also providing a few more ad, uh, renovate or additions in the back. Once again, we're adding a new bus loading loop, um, and also adding some additional staff parking on the west side of the site. And once again, the, the fields are staying generally in their, their current location. So this, um, this sequencing, we would build the new classroom addition first, as well as the new um, the bus loop. And that would allow us to get into the existing building and start, start renovating. That first uh, phase of the construction, the new classroom building, would take about probably two years in a summer or two. And then we would move, into, um, move the kids into the new addition and start renovating the older parts of the building in phase two, which also would also take about a year. The next uh, option we looked at is a, a new construction option. It's a, it's a four-story classroom building, similar in mass to the existing Maury High School. And once again, this diagram shows the learning spaces and also all, all the other uh, EdSpec program elements mapped into the into the floor plan and once again the blue is classroom, yellows are commons spaces, the red is PE, green is admin and the purple is the uh, theater and music spaces. This shows the, um, the massing of this particular design and one, one important thing to note is um, we are able to build the entire new building in behind the existing footprint. You see the dashed line in the lower left-hand corner of that green space. We are, we are able to build the new building, completely finish it before we come back um, and, and start redressing the rest of the site. You can see we've also provided um, a new drop-off loop for buses. Uh, because this building is a little bit more consolidated in footprint, it also frees up some additional site space and we are able to get a a much larger practice field with a non-regulation quarter mile track and potentially some additional spectator seating on the site, which, which is not something they don't currently have. So the phasing for this is quite simple. We build the new building in the back, use the front of the site for staging space, and then after the new building is finished in about uh, two years and maybe three months, come back and um, demolish the existing building and flip the site and build the fields and recreation hours in front of the site. We, we took particular care with this concept and also with the next one to make sure we were orienting the front door and the front of the school towards the Ghent community because that was important. We heard that with the community meetings. And also the, um, the new adjacency to the, the neighborhood is now green space and recreational space. So that's important to note. And then the fourth option that we looked at, also a, a new construction option, was a, was a six-story. And the reason we looked at a six-story was just to see if additional consolidation of footprint gained us anything in terms of additional site amenities. And the answer was that it really didn't. Um, if you look at the site layout, we still get, get the same site amenities that we got with the four-story. The six-story six version ended up being a little bit more expensive which we'll get into when we start talking about the cost. But it's, it's another approach to look at it. There are some tall buildings around that site, so going, going even more vertical might have some merit in terms of exploration. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through the construction phasing on C1 because it's so similar to B2 and I'm in the, in the context of time. Mm -hmm. What I really wanna do is focus on stacking all four schedules together and looking at, looking at them in comparison. So what we see overall 
is that they all take about the same overall <coughs> duration from the time we, we bid the project to construction is complete. Um, 36 to 38 months, the, uh, the, the C1 six-story option actually, um, well, actually, a, A5, A, A1, and C1 are all 38 months, and the B2 option is a little bit shorter. But there are two um, primary differentiators between these schedules. And the first differentiator is that option A1 puts students in temporary classrooms for, for two years. And the other primary differentiator between the four options is that the new construction options, B2 and C1, actually get the students into a complete modern school building about a year before the renovation options. So as I said, uh, data-driven process, we took these plans and we, we went back to the ed specs and developed a very um, comprehensive rubric based on the design principles that I shared with you earlier, such as build on tradition, um, be timeless, focus on the future. Each one of those, we, we described attributes to those and we went about scoring these four design concepts in the context of how well they accommodated the educational program. And you can, you can see from the, uh, the numbers at the top, across the top there, that um, B2 scored the best score. Um, A5 was kind of neck and neck with it. Um, C, C1 slightly behind that, and A, A1, the, um, the renovation option running, running slightly high. To note, we also, um, we also factored in the existing facility, and that's the, the far column. So, so that gives us kind of a baseline of how well the existing building, Maury High School, accommodates the, the vision of the ed spec that scored 45%, whereas B2 and A5 scored in the 97%. So the total range of the options that we scored was 87 to 92%, which all in all is really a pretty good um, score across the board in terms of accommodating educational uh, adequacy. When we looked at uh, the same type of analysis for desired site elements, once again, we, we, we described attributes that would contribute to good quality vehicular circulation, parking, physical education, and team sports, and once again, scored those. In this particular scoring, as you could probably guess, the B2 and C1 options scored much better August 3rd. than the A, A1, A5 options because the B2, C1 options consolidated the footprint and allowed us to get more site amenities such as the replacement field and the, uh, and the track on the site. And this is the composite scoring of, of the four options. And you can see that across the board, B2 scored the highest with respect to um, educational program accommodation. And then A1 or A5 were at the lower end of the scale with respect to accommodating. So with that, um, Jack's going to touch briefly on how we looked at budget cost estimates and life cycle cost analysis. So now that Mike's taken through the process that we have uh, concepts established, the next step was to create more data. So this data is related to project budgets and life, cy life cycle cost. Um, we actually brought in another consultant in this case. It's a contractor who's done a lot of work in um, Hampton Roads and Norfolk particularly uh, to help with the cost forecast. So this is a summary page. It's actually two pages. The first page uh, deals with uh, four columns of information. Those four columns relate to the uh, concepts that Mike just reviewed. Um, you're going to get a subtotal at the bottom of this page followed up by the next page which at the midpoint of that page it summarizes total estimated construction cost. And it's important that there's two categories of costs here. Um, from, from that midpoint up to the first page, talks about construction cost only. There's another important part, and that's soft cost, which is also considered project cost. And these are all everything else that's required in 
in uh, order to do the projects that does not include construction. Um, one, one important column on the far left side for the uh, A1 option deals with the portable um, trailers associated with, with classrooms, and that's in and of itself is about a $3 million cost including um, the trailer as well as utility support. So it's significant, it has a, a significant cost impact. And restrooms. Um, and thank you, and restrooms. Um, but you can see the, there, the range between the highest to the uh, lowest cost, there's about a 15% range in cost. The, the, the line item showing the numbers are numbers that are actually in 2021 dollars. So they range from 115 million to 135 million. Um, we, we thought it was important for the board to understand what it would cost today to go to the midpoint of uh, construction. So you can see the numbers changed um, directly below for each concept. So in this case, they're including the escalation to the midpoint of construction, it's 140 million to $164 million. And it's important to note that we're currently in a construction escalation range of about six and a half to seven percent per year. Yeah. So the, in terms of the, of this one topic, we think this slide really represents important data for the board to understand. Um, it it deals with life cycle cost and the impact that it has on any decision making related to the study. Um, as you can see on the two uh, concepts on the left, there's a lot more information there with respect to cost. And there's two categories that, need, that we evaluated. One is a life cycle cost for maintenance and also for energy. And they specifically apply to the renovation models because there are existing buildings that are to remain. There's cost with maintaining those older buildings. And there's also cost from an energy standpoint because the buildings were not as efficient as they are today in new construction. So that energy cost per square foot is going up. So it contributes to the overall life cycle cost, which now if you compare the renovation models, there are 164 and 180 million versus the replacement school options, which are at 158 and 164 million. Thank you, Jack. So that takes us to our summary analysis and our recommended next steps. So this, this slide is just a very simple graphic that shows how we looked at all the overall feasibility factors in our evaluation summary. It's unweighted, so we, we, everyone weighs the same. You know, we'll look to you and the community to tell us some of these should be more important than others, but for right now it's unweighted. But even with that, you can see that with the exception of the lowest first cost criteria, option B2, which was the four-story replacement, scored the best in all the other evaluation criteria. So that's, that's important to note. So recommended next steps, we've, uh, we've shared a, the draft modernization versus replacement feasibility study with you and now we await your feedback on the content and our preliminary analysis and we'll take that feedback and, and update our, our draft report. And then what we're proposing next is to engage in a community engagement process and to share both the process and the data and the analysis from this Maury High School modernization replacement feasibility study with the community in a series of public meetings to solicit their feedback and their input. And we're proposing that these meetings could be co-facilitated with cooperative strategies. They were involved in our inspect process, and I know they're working with you on your long-range facility plan. But we would co-facilitate these with, with the uh, split being we would present the study and the findings, and they would, they would do the community games piece, the polling, and asking for the, the input and the feedback. Once we receive that feedback from the community, we would um, put that together in a form that, that makes sense and present it back to you with some summary analysis, and then uh, also provide some draft preliminary recommendations to, to the board at that point. 
and then request guidance from you with respect to how to go about completing the study. So that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. <laughs> I'm sure you have lots of questions. Yes. So um, normally I don't do this, but I'm going to take a privilege and just quick questions from me. Um, timeline that you just gave, do you have a end date when you're saying you're going to come back to the board? Is there a month that we're kind of looking at? Um, we, we don't have that. that. That really is at your, at your pleasure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the longer we take, the more this is going to cost. Is that mm -hmm. what it's? 7% a year. Mm -hmm. Got it. <laughs> um, so I, I know, um, are you able with any of these new um, construction, are you able to keep any of the original um, aspects of the building? It, was that any consideration? With the new construction with options? With new construction, was there any consideration in incorporating <clears throat> actual items from the original building if you went to build a new building? We didn't get, really get into the architectural design too much, but I, I, I'm sure that whichever architect was engaged in that project could be very responsive to the historic character of the exist build, existing building. I don't, I don't know that they would design something that looked like it was built 100 years ago, but it would be a modern uh, institutional aesthetic mm -hmm. appropriate to the, the context of the community. Yeah, and then there's also an opportunity to include within the new school um, documentation and um, possibly a museum or something to, to um, reflect the history of the Moore High School within within the new facility. So thank you very much for um, your presentation, and it's very thorough, and I and I think it's very well laid out for us to, be able to understand. Um, but and you also mentioned the Sliver Library. I've worked there for the past six years, mm -hmm. um, so I do know there are some challenges if considering options of um, saving some of the old and the new, especially as we work toward moder modernization and. Um, and beyond, right, mm -hmm. the future of our, our children's education. So is, have, was there anything that came up when you did a study on, or you know, when you looked at what some of those um, costs to maintain or to um, integrate uh, into the old, the old building with the new? Yeah, that actually goes to the, um, the last slide that Jack talked to. I mean, mm -hmm. The moisture infiltration right. through the existing exterior walls, they're, they're, they're nothing but brick. And all we can do is slow it down, mm -hmm. and maybe slow it down for 10, 10 years. And then we've got to come back and recoat with um, moisture resistant coating. So every 10 years, you're going to be recoating the building. And, and all we can do is slow it down. So you're still going to have moisture, some moisture coming through the building. And you know what the interior walls look like when they get wet. The plaster starts peeling and the paint starts peeling. So there'll be ongoing, every 10 or 15 years, continued maintenance of that exterior wall assembly with with our renovation modernization option and that, right. that's that extra money that was in our life cycle delta mm -hmm. that, and that i heard you say that, that 16 but to i guess i'm more dollars. concerned with the specifics about the educational programming mm -hmm. and the the ability to um provide that type of next century um educational setting mm -hmm and how it may not be the same in the new part of the building as in the old part of the building, right? We might not be able to <clears throat> have the type of, um, mm -hmm. I, don't, we, we, I mean, Sliver had, has lots of issues where one building uses one set of wiring or air conditioning yeah. or, you know, um, the, or the amount of renovation programming in one and not the other. The amount of re renovation we're talking about, the only thing we're keeping is the structure. Everything else is completely new. So. They should be equal mm -hmm. in terms of technology, wiring, HVAC systems, er every other component. So the only thing, only thing that will continue to age is the structure and the exterior skin of the building. Maybe I missed it because if we, if we were to keep that facade in the front, mm -hmm. um, well, could that be maintained through historical credits or is there a certain percentage of the building that would need to be historically preserved to um, in, in order to take qualify. advantage of the historical tax credits in Virginia because it doesn't qualify for federal what what the analysis we did is we could probably if we save the exterior scan we might be able to um, benefit from between six and seven million dollars worth of tax credits annually or just period period, period. Okay. okay but the offset to that 
uh, analysis is that just doing that, the process of going through historical rest restoration, would add about a year or more to the overall design process. Mm -hmm. And uh, adding a year to the design process moves the bid date and the construction out a year, and that would also add about 7% of cost to the project. So you, you, you lose your entire benefit. My last question is, so based on the the different um, configurations that you showed here, do you, so it seems that you feel like the keeping the, the original footprint is the way to go? Or am I? We're, we're not at a recommendation <laughs> station. Okay. <laughs> because I see it's so close to the street, and I'm always wondering, like, maybe if we pushed it back a little bit. I well, <laughs> I mean, the, the option that scored the best was the four-story building okay. that B2. we built behind B2. the okay. existing school. Okay. So I'm not sure I'm following your question. Okay. Sorry, never so, mind. Ms. Martin, I did have a follow-up, though, on your question about the adaptability. I think this was the question. The adaptability of the old building to... Um, respect new planning requirements for educational mm -hmm. spaces, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, the, so believe it or not, Mori is actually a concrete frame building within the inside, the internal piece of it. So there, there are rows of columns which do set, set up and could um, limit or restrict um, classroom types that could be dealt with, but they, that is a factor that's completely different than a new building framing system, which we would look for larger spans and to create flexibility with respect to the floor plan. And that, that's why in our educational specification accommodation analysis, the renovation options scored in the 80 percent in the new construction in, in the high 90s. Yeah. Okay. So they aren't, they're doing well, they're just not doing as well as the new construction yeah. model. Okay, thanks. So we're going to miss Camps and uh, Ms. Ms. Um, we had an old school here, the school that I was principal in when we were doing last decade, when we were doing the, the um, improvements, which they all ended up being, all the schools were, uh, most of the schools were knocked down. And in this school is the 1939 Art Deco building. A lot of the school buildings are just school buildings. Mm. You know, knock mm. them down, that's, that's the way to go. That's where I would usually go. See, so my question here, and after, especially after listening to Dr. Martin, who had some very good points on what do you do to save what you have because of the attachments and the historical interest. And what I had asked to do then was because the building, even though I sat in front of my car and cried when they were knocking it down, it needed to go for the needs of the children. But what I asked for and did not get was why not do it in the style of an Art Deco building to replicate it? They didn't, for some reason, they chose to do mid-century, which had nothing to do with Ocean View School. Um, but is that something that happens sometimes where you look at a historical thing and you were able to recreate the feel of the, of the time that it was there, like Ocean View Art Deco, rather than mid-century, yeah. <laughs> which has no relationship to anything? I mean, is that something that people do with these older buildings, especially the school buildings that people get so attached to? Mm -hmm. I can understand the attachment that all the generations of Mari High School uh, graduates have. But on the other hand, our focus has to stick on what's best for the children and offering them a 21st century education. But if, you're, if you start from scratch building the whole thing, couldn't you do something like that where you would go back to the time period that it was built and yet you'd be building a totally new building. And as an architect, I can answer that we would, achieve, we, would, we would strive to create a modern interpretation of the historic building. That wouldn't look like mid-century for Art Deco. No, but it, 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 would, have, it would have the massing and the, the ornamentation. It would, I would mean, when I look at Mar with the columns and things, yeah. can't we would replicate something like that? It probably wouldn't have like that? ornamentation because that, that would be probably not economical. Why? I love it too. I don't know if you remember early in the presentation, there were some principles that came out of the, um, out of our stakeholder group. And the last one that Mike referenced was community context. So it was important to the people that we were dealing with from a committee standpoint that we needed to 
respect the community context and in whatever solution is is mm -hmm. pursued because it's very important I, I think that's the yeah. charge to your architect is he wants yeah. you to design a building that respects the historical nature of the building or respects the community context but still provides a modern and event. see and that's what what we were looking for we got knocked down on it mm -hmm. but that's what we were looking for was to not just pay homage to Art Deco but to make it an Art Deco building I mean people build their houses now like that mm -hmm. but that just got killed and and then and then I then why not put a modern 21st century school looking and rather than something that has no relationship at all to modern day building or 1930 building so okay so that's something I can start yelling screaming about again and, and lose again <laughs> We, we still have a time that we'll be able okay, to Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Bassine, thank you, Ms. Campson. Um, thank you. And thank you, thank you for the presentation and, and all of the information that you've provided to us for today's meeting. I'm, I'll be frank, I'm digesting all of the information uh, that you've put forward and going back and also, um, you know, refreshing on the first phase, which mm -hmm. was the educational specifications. Um, so if, if we could go back to that, that slide, I wanted to point out something with the, under the prospects. Which, which with slide? With the SWAT, I think it was um, the four one of the four, earlier four slides blue. in the phase one. It was, I think one, or, it might be the second one. Um, so, so with the design, um, in mind, you obviously are looking at the programming. And one of the prospects that was listed there and something that I, you know, would like to see us do is expand, you know, the health sciences program. Keep going. And so that was a principle that was incorporated mm -hmm. into your conceptual design model, correct? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so. Keep going? How far? Oh. Well, I just started talking. Well, it was on one of the. <laughs> this sounds like what I was doing. It was. It was in the beginning. It's, it's the um, one with the four blue. Yeah, it, it was okay. the spot analysis. Yeah. Okay. So, the so and honestly, I mean, I just wanted to show it as as yeah under the prospects um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <coughs> piece, and so that has been incorporated into like if yes. we were if we as a board were to decide that we wanted a school wide health and sciences academy at the school where we're you know providing lots of CT opportunity mm. certifications and like you know that no. we could do that we with are. that design the, the well we are but I mean to expand it the, edu the edu whole. educational specification actually included enough flexibility that it could be a, a school within a school program huh? or it could be a a themed high school okay all right and and also how much of the conceptual design was also um, uh, may, uh, done with the idea that it was also focused on the health and well-being of the students and the staff in the building. Um, so like could we possibly put a student or not just a student but a school-based clinic um, you know that we mm -hmm. could it, those are just some things that I think, you know, I would like to see us do as a division when we can do a holistic look at the whole division, have, you know, school-based health clinics mm -hmm. around that <clears throat> might serve our students and our staff and we, we, families. We did have a placeholder in the program for community services types of programs, but they were unidentified. Okay. It was a placeholder. Because, you know, I've, in conferences and stuff that we've attended, I've gone to several sessions mm -hmm. where, um, you know, new school design and construction, incorporating the health and well-being and the emotional well-being and knowing what we commonly see happening in school buildings as a result of the design that doesn't really meet the needs of students. And, you know, one, for example, two weeks ago, you know, also went to a session that even talked about bathrooms, you know, and how the bathrooms are designed in new models where mm -hmm. there's a common area out in the open where students wash their hands, not in a private enclosed space, but in an open space so that, and they have seen less incidents, you know, in bathrooms, mm -hmm. for instance. 
things like that. Those are things like I, you know I would like to see. Um, but that's just just some initial feedback. So so this design for the new building or renovation has flexibility to offer those yes, kinds of spaces. Okay. And so with the renovation, if I heard correctly, our students could be in portable classrooms for up to two years, correct? With the, the more extensive renovation model, which was the A1. With the A1. Where you're keeping more of the existing buildings. Okay, and that was rated lower than mm -hmm. the others. And then for those that had higher ratings, if I heard correctly, the site space where we have fields and um, you know the grounds, that may be compromised while the new building is being built. Is that correct? Correct. So where would, um, you know, where would students practice and do all the extracurriculars that typically take place on those during that building phase? In either scenario, you're going to have displacement of the ability to use recreational fields because even in the renovation model, you have to have a place for the contractor mm, right. and materials to be. So I think in any of those four models, you're going to have to accommodate physical education and um, sports off-site off -site. during for those okay. three years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Mr. Fraley has done some research on that. If, if you could take just a moment, if you want to, to, so to respond. Elementary has significant space behind right. it, mm -hmm. and, and we would move to that area. Okay. And, and so that's already been as the site. So I was curious about what the costs might be associated with you know, any other um, facility or property that we might use. Shoot, I'm so sorry. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. It just collapsed. Uh, okay. Any costs associated with housing or providing those opportunities for our students? So it sounds like we would just you, get spa the get elementary space. If there was an be. expectation that there would be a wash area because of, you know, students being behind again for an extended period of time, we could create accommodations for that. There might be a, a cost in there. Okay. So we would certainly consider it. But generally they go, they have their activity, and then they come back to the physical building. Okay. Or the 48 mobile students, depending on which one. Okay. okay, so in the interest of time, okay. I mean, you I'll, probably have some more in there. I, Ms. I, Ms. I do, but, um. <laughs> but I'm quite sure that, um, Mr. Fraley, if we had additional questions, Dr. Birdsong, we could, uh, maybe do some two by twos, right? That's or fine. something. Fine. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and just in the interest of time, I know I saw Dr. Gabriel. I don't know, Mr. Jordan, if you had a question or Dr. Rousen or. I just had a comment. Okay. Right, let them go All ahead. Right, so I'm going to let Dr. Rousen and, and then Mr. I'll Jordan. And, uh, yeah, I just had a comment because I was in a community maybe 20, 25 years ago that was building a high school, a very historic high school and um and there were mixed emotions about it mm -hmm. and it's really interesting you know what came out of it is that some of the oldest alums in the school decided that a new school was the best thing to happen for you know kids some i think a lady was a hundred that was there she's i think <clears throat> kids now need a new school a better school but there were certain takeaways that they wanted they wanted some of the old auditorium which it was very beautiful for some of them to be kept Mm -hmm. and somehow arranged maybe in the front of the auditorium or the back there was a school seal that they wanted to be mounted in the new school and something about a showcase that they had since the building of the school if that could somehow be renovated and put in the school so it was like three things that they wanted and for them to go in and build a brand new school and i thought that was very powerful mm. yeah and, and they also asked for um a very small room in the school that would be a museum room, mm -hmm. a very small yeah. area that could be capture pictures and things mm -hmm. like that within the new school. Yeah, that's that's so kind of what that, I was alluding to. That was a beautiful yeah. kind of compromise. I'm not sure whether that had even been talked about, or even brought up in some of the community meetings or whatever. But I thought that was very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was it was discussed. That's what yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's it's kind of what I alluded what I alluded in terms in terms of creating space within the the new building to mm -hmm. respect and honor the tradition of of the original building because it is a beautiful old building. Mm -hmm. It is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just a couple of comments, I guess. Um, starting with one, one question. The, the enrollment size, that was around 1,900 students. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Okay. So I, I still think as a, as a board and, and team, we need to, uh, as part of this discussion moving forward, 
look at our high school attendance zones uh, in alignment with this. Um, you know, we still haven't, I think we're still operating on the same attendance zones since the 1970s. And um, we've had some conversations over the years about, uh, you know, whether you go north, south, or east, west. But, but I think it's something we should also look at and consider as, as part of this. And as, as part of that, um, with the community uh, engagement sessions, uh, we, we made some changes so that the, as part of the feeder pattern, the uh, St. Helena community uh, feeds into Blair, that feeds into Maury. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure uh, if we did that prior to the last round of discussion. So as we talk about community context and making sure that we have uh, inclusive voices, I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the fact that the, the St. Helena community is now also a part of the Maury attendance zone, at least as it, as it exists today. Okay. So I made lots of notes, but those are the two things I just wanted to put on the table for, for consideration as we discuss next steps. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it, Mr. Jordan, because that's actually one something I've been really pushing, because I don't know if y'all probably know how I feel, I'd like to get rid of attendance zones. I said I would like to get rid of attendance zones and give choice where students can follow their career pathways, but that's like a whole nother well, discussion. I've but advocated that for 30 years, so. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Dr. Gabriel. <clears throat> I'm so excited for this presentation. I feel like I have been waiting for this for many, many years. And going back to when Dr. Birdsong presented the strategic plan, and she felt like she had birthed a child. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like since 2012, when I started the board and was attending meetings and listening to parents, and they were like, when's a new Maury High School going to come? We need a new Maury High School. And five other schools came, and here we are with Maury High School. And I have to give credit to our city counterparts the mayor of the city council because our talk was just talk but now it is reality we have a hundred and fifty million dollars committed by the city council just for Maury alone and that is what is enabling us to have this discussion today and so I'm going to ask my colleagues here we need to push ourselves on this timeline I am sold on B2 you have done the data you have discussed it with parents it incorporates the expansion of the medical high school program which I am a graduate of uh, and I personally have lived through a transition with Granby High School transitioning between what we called Granby 2 to Granby 1 so I have experienced all of this I'm ready to take action I'm ready to put on paper and vote on what this timeline is going to be get to the community assess any further feedback, but I am ready to start moving and making this, this dream a true reality for our students. And uh, I really appreciate the thoroughness because when we do go back to the community and, we, and they ask us, well, what was your rationale between renovate versus replace? We have great data to support this. Two years of mobile units, one-time use of tax credits, all of this will add up and at the end of the day I do want to preserve some of the very historic pieces within Maury High School. I appreciate that now as an alumni of Granby because when I drive by the schools I, I, it is a beautiful piece of architecture and one that is definitely characteristic of our city uh, and so I'm ready to move and I will do whatever I can to, to um, push our, our, our board to that because I want to see some action on this so we can get started on this ASAP. Absolutely. Dr. Gabriel, it's that. also done a year earlier. <laughs> the what? It'll be completed a year earlier. Yes. In, in, in budget. But so with that spirit there, um, I was just uh, chatting with Dr. Birdsong. Um, on these proposed next steps, I really like to get a calendar on it so that we can be able to mm -hmm. just say these are the things that the expectation. So uh, just consulting with Dr. Birdsong, I like to add this to the agenda for 921. Um, for us to, um, to take an action on the timeline. Um, is everybody okay with that? Yes. 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 Okay. Just, just for clarity, I'm not sure. Can you explain what you mean? So they gave a proposed next steps slide, but they don't have dates on it. So what I'm, I'm proposing is that the administration come back to us on 921 with actual dates for these items here. Do we need to decide which option we're no, going no, no. to No, because we, we still have community engagement Definitely. that we got to go okay. back so okay. we're putting it out here in the atmosphere these are the four options 
um, our due diligence is to go back to the community mm -hmm. get some additional feedback on that and then for them to come back with a proposal right. so on the okay. 21st we'll have some dates on when we're expecting those things so that we can have an end date for when the board should take action mm -hmm. Is that cool with everybody yeah. mm -hmm. so it's okay. just the, it's great. the timeline really yeah with the timeline <laughs> right. yep okay. oh, exactly thank you so much thank you, right. thank you for your time thank you um, the next item we've got is the um, back to school update dr. Pohl yes and I'm going to excuse myself for just a moment dr. <laughs> sorry you already have it open on the bottom it looks like Sorry, Ms. Tanner and I were fighting over the computer usage here. <laughs> How did you do it? Perfect. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, Chairman Clanton, Vice Chair Dr. Gabriel, members of the board, and Dr. Birdsong. I'm here this time to uh, review the return to learn information for the fall of 2022. This presentation will give an overview of instructional updates, the Virtual Scholars Academy, safety, security, and health updates, multi tiered systems of support, or MTSS student transportation and operations, staffing updates, and our, we have two illustrious NPS principals with us that will share their opening plans at their school. The focus on instruction and data-driven decisions will continue this school year, with pacing and curriculum revisions being updated by mid-August. Over the past year and through the summer, the curriculum and instruction team gathered assessment data and feedback from teachers to collaborate and revise unit assessments and to improve data collection and feedback processes for the upcoming school year to ensure, ensure our teachers are using that data. Additionally, science hands-on learning lab kits for grades four through eight have been purchased and teachers will learn about integrating these activities during the science symposium that's taking place on August 8th and throughout professional development sessions during the year. There's also extensive tutoring program will be continued to be staffed for the early literacy program that we started this year. The middle school reading and mathematics support classes will also be staffed, as well as a continued partnership with the literacy lab at nine of our elementary schools. The partnerships with FEV Tutor for 24-7 tutoring opportunities and for universe, with university instructors for live tutors will continue with a focused deployment based on needs as seen in the preliminary SOL data. So we're equitably distributing those tutors from university instructors to support the needs across the division. <coughs> Starting at the beginning of the year, as we discussed a little bit earlier, the use of the integrated software such as Lexia Core 5 and Edmund's Exact Path will have a focus on reading and math support that will be continued. New this year is Edmund's Courseware that focuses on credit recovery and on time in course recovery following any unit assessment to ensure, help ensure students do not fall behind during the year so that credit recovery becomes a thing of the past. Dual enrollment growth will help in continuing to expand course offerings to support the concurrent earning of the Uniformed Certificate of General Studies passport, which consists of transferable credits to in-state colleges and universities, or the possibility of our students earning an associate's degree while in high school. The advanced CTE pathway expansions include a new, the new aviation and aerospace programming and a young entrepreneurs program, a year-round also a year-round work-based learning experience with in-person experience for high school students and virtual job shadowing for middle school students and extending CT opportunities to the elementary level via partnerships such as junior achievement. Additionally, IEP goal data collection and progress monitoring includes continued implementation and consistency of division-wide practices with IP, IEP data collection and progress monitoring through the use of rethink tools that we integrated this year. Additionally, the expanded use of Rethink Visual scaffolded instructional tools will support specially designed instruction and access of general curriculum for students with disabilities in grades pre-K through 12. The Practical and Exploration System Labs, or PAYS, will be a part of the post-secondary transition and career development labs implemented at all secondary schools to begin this fall. Additionally, a pre-K-3 inclusion classroom has been added and the movement of, of pre-K-3 and pre-K-4 early childhood special education classrooms has been completed to support equitable access across the division. This summer, there have been several learning opportunities for teachers and administrators. These include options such as the literacy retreat for reading specialists, a science symposium coming up on August 8th, 
PD preparing for the implementation of the second grade integrated, integrated curriculum that begins this fall. The cultural competency supports and core curriculum. New Zealand certified educators training to increase in content reading. Data discussions in history and social sciences, Edmentum and Lexia updates for administrators, strategic mm -hmm. instruction model strategies for students with disabilities, applied behavior an analysis and social emotional learning concepts, and professional learning cohorts with an option for registered behavior technician certification in the continued development and implementation of an NPS coaching framework. And as you heard earlier on Monday and Tuesday of this week, the Summer Leadership Institute was held. And finally, as we prepare for the fall, there will be, of course, a continuation of the school level data meetings to support differentiated needs at each and every school for each and every student. This year, the Virtual Scholars Academy is being offered with NPS teachers for students in grades four and five and with virtual Virginia teachers in all other grades. Initially, all elementary students were going to be taught by NPS teachers. However, with low interest and in enrollment in the early grades, we had to offer the opportunity through Virtual Virginia so that we could retain those students as Norfolk students. The deadline for applications was April 29th, and the deadline for enrollment in Virtual Virginia was July 15th. There were a total of 920 applications that were sent in during the application window. The students had to have passing grades as of third quarter and no more than eight unexcused absences. After students were selected in categories of yes and maybe, they, they, then, they were then sent to schools for further review to see if virtual would be an ideal placement for each student. There were a total of 428 student names in the yes or maybe category sent to schools. Yes, students, of course, satisfied the requirements. Maybe students might have had one failing grade or 10 absences, a, a little bit more than what was on the application, and feedback was gleaned from the schools on the maybe student list to see if they were viable candidates for online learning. For the yes and maybe students with IEPs and 504s, meetings had to be held before acceptance to ensure accommodations could be met and to ensure that virtual learning was an appropriate placement. There were 103 students that were reviewed that had IEPs and 504s for the program. Letters and contracts were sent June 6th to students in grades 6 through 12 to be returned by June 30th. The contract was an agreement that was made around the responsibilities of being an online learner that included the parent accepting those responsibilities. And then scheduling began for it to meet the July 15th deadline. Multiple phone calls were also made to parents to return the acceptance paperwork and contracts. Parents had the opportunity to decline or accept their VSA placement. Phone calls and letters were sent to parents in grades one through three on July 7th once the choice was made to offer virtual Virginia since we, we didn't have the enrollment or the teachers for the grades one through three. And this, um, all classes had to be still scheduled by July 15th. Letters and phone calls were sent out to parents in grades four and five on July 19th, once the staffing was secured for grades four and five. And we have a total of 289 students enrolled in VSA for the 22-23 school year. This slide shows the breakdown of students in virtual Virginia and in NPS classes and with NPS teachers, as well as the breakdown by grade level for all students and with our students with disabilities that are enrolled. If you see here, we have a, a percentage of 19% of our students, our students with disability, and division-wide, we run a little over 15%. So we're pretty close to that ratio. This slide has the racial breakdown of this coming year's enrollment as compared to last year's enrollment at this time. As seen, this data is very similar, not only year to year, but to our overall percentages for each subgroup. As the 2022-2023 school year begins, we're prepared to follow the latest CDC guidelines for the safety and well-being of everyone. The core mitigation strategies will remain in place with masking being an option and hygiene etiquette continuing to be a priority. There will be, uh, there will be continue, continuous reminders to ensure hand washing occurs frequently, respiratory etiquette is practiced consistently, buildings are being sanitized daily, and following protocols for contact tracing based on the latest CDC guidelines. The NPS daily dashboard will continue to keep the community informed of the secondary mitigation metrics and continued collaboration with the Norfolk Department of Public Health will be in place to ensure the health and safety of students and staff. 
Daily updates on the new COVID cases and percent of positive cases diagnosed will continue to be updated on the website. And the dashboard in includes totals of cases of staff and students as part of the dashboard display. The NPS webpage and every school's webpage displays a screening tool that reminds staff and family to monitor their health issues on a daily basis. COVID-19 vaccinations continue to be available throughout the community, and the NPS Student Wellness Department is also working to ensure families have information to access scheduled immunizations for their students. And throughout Norfolk Public Schools, each school will continue its intentional support of students' social emotional learning needs through Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports, or PBIS, under the umbrella of the Virginia Tiered Systems of Support. Schools will also continue to host after school activities through clubs, organizations, and athletics. Each school will have a wellness champion and counselors that will, the counseling supports will be provided for students through the school counseling department, social workers, and school psychologists. And after school activities will be allowed and students will have transportation on the 5 p.m. activity buses for both middle and high schools. <coughs> Excuse me. Moving on to transportation where the mission is to provide safe, efficient, and reliable transportation to NPS students of Norfolk. While the bus driver shortage, while the bus driver shortages, there has been a focus on being as efficient as possible. The time traveled for each route, distance traveled for each route, and the number of students transported in each route has been reviewed to help build the most efficient routes for the coming school year. Transportation team recently realigned the school routing pairings to create a more efficient system. Each of the four quadrants has numerous elementary schools, at least one middle school and at least one high school. This was done to pair schools for proximity as well as transitional pairings from elementary to middle to high school. This shortens routes and consumes less fuel. Drivers are also being aligned within these quadrants to promote their geographic expertise within each one. The Transportation Department, in collaboration with Learning Support Special Education, is moving towards offering division-wide programs in each quadrant, which will minimize long bus rides for our students. And to promote safety and better communication to parents and guardians for the locations of their children or riding on our school buses, GPS tracking abilities for student ridership is being expanded. This new innovation will inform us of who is on the bus by student name, what time they got on the bus, where they got on the bus and where they exited the bus and then overall how many are on the bus for a true ridership this will be piloted at one school in the fall before looking into possibilities of an expansion this will also assist with maximizing student ridership for routing support the students who will be a part of the pilot program will be issued a student id card it will be used as a swipe card for gps for a gps tracking scanner mounted on the bus dashboard as seen in that top picture the driver will then be informed of the following, that the student's an authorized rider or non-authorized rider, this is a duplicate rider, and that the student is exiting at the correct stop. It will also allow parents and guardians a time scan of what address the student entered and exited the bus. As you're aware, when students returned to school for in-person learning in March of 2021, school start times were staggered so that buses could be properly sanitized between routes. These staggered time adjustments will remain in effect for the coming school year. Bus drivers will continue to routinely sanitize seats in frequently touched areas after each route, which is, takes an estimated 10 to 15 minutes. Staggered school times will start on the first day of school and are in remain in place until further notice. Moving on to breakfast and lunch and meals, they will still be, they will be free of charge for all students with no applications <coughs> needed. New this school year, all sites that offer an after-school program and activity will offer a snack time or a school dinner meal service. All meals this year must be consumed on site, effective the first day of school, which means no more grab-and-go sites this year. As a part of our continued efforts to attract highly qualified candidates, the Department of Human Resources has hosted and attended nearly 40 teacher-specific recruitment events over the past year. We hosted seven of our own job fairs and traveled across the United States to 31 events hosted by other organizations, primarily colleges and universities with teacher education programs. The dedication to recruitment has resulted in the filling of 230 positions to date, 
188 of these candidate commitments are classroom-based positions, and 42 are non-classroom-based positions. Candidate comment, commitments to serving NPS typically come in two forms, early commitment letters and contractual agreements. The early commitment letter is a good faith agreement between the candidate and the school division where an NPS offers a qualified person a teaching position with the plan to schedule their new hire process in the immediate future. A signed contract follows the early commitment. The formal employment contract is signed at the new hire appointment. Currently, we have 81 candidates in the early commitment stage of the hiring process and 149 contract or candidates in the contractual side of the uh, hiring process. You can see the breakdown by classroom and non-classroom placements in the chart on this slide. In addition to these full-time employment placements, HR began offering long-term substitutes, MOUs, for the 22-23 school year, the week of <coughs> July 25th, 2022, which is the earliest we have advertised or extended long-term substitute positions. In just three days, over 30% of those jobs were filled by a commitment, a committed substitute pool. In collaboration with building principals, Norfolk Public Schools is proud to offer increased substitute pay rates for the school year 22-23, a decision we believe will positively impact the substitute fill rates throughout the school year. Long-term substitutes with a four-year degree will earn $27 an hour, up from $23 an hour, and those long-term substitutes without a four-year degree will earn $21 an hour, an increase from the previous year's $18 an hour. And finally, daily substitutes will be paid the rate of $17.50 an hour, a $3.50 rate over last year's um, rate. The Department of Human Resources will continue to fill all vacancies, whether full-time or part-time, such as substitute teachers on a rolling basis, and we look forward to presenting an updated staffing report as we near the start of the school year. While recruitment is an important component of HR's mission, equally important is our commitment to retention. For the school year 2022-2023, NPS retained 87.3% of its teacher workforce. This retention rate is higher than the national average for urban city school divisions, which is around 82%. Our internal data reveals that while teachers have elected to leave Norfolk Public Schools, the number of teachers who leave NPS for another local school division has decreased to 15.6% of the total teacher terminations, or 1.9% of the total teacher population. Of the 315 teacher terminations, only 49 were for a transfer to another local school division. We believe that this data dispels the myth that teachers are departing NPS in large numbers for surrounding school divisions. Can I help clap on that one? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is worth celebrating. Matter of fact, can you just say that again? There. I just want to make sure anybody missed it. What? Yeah. Yes. So we decreased to 15.6% of our total teacher terminations going to local school, school divisions other than Norfolk, or one, only 1.9% 1 of our total teaching staff who've left. So 49 of the 350 te 315 teachers moved to go to a different division, which is, which is low. And I think the other thing to clap about is the retention rate of 87.3 versus the National of Urban Schools of 82%. Can I say I just really like getting clapped about the data? I love that. <laughs> just puts a smile under this mask that you guys can't see that much. But. Applause now, right? <laughs> Before moving to our principals, a reminder to the board and to the community about the sixth grade transition to middle school program, which runs from 8.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. on Monday, August 8th, and Tuesday, August 9th. And the high school programs who also run their programs on the 8th and 9th from 7.30 to 11.30 a.m. All schools will host welcome back to school activities to include new student orientation, device and school supply pickups. Welcome to the new school year, sixth grade transition. Our family engagement efforts will continue to inform our families as we make them feel welcome throughout the school division. Any student who may be new to the school or wants to attend these events are welcomed to attend. It doesn't just have to be a grade level, it can be any new student who, who attends any of these transition programs. Again, this year, school supplies will be provided for students through ESSER funds at every school. And at this time, I'll be turning the presentation over to a proud panther, Dr. Lucy Litchmore, <laughs> as she shows up. No, not a panther. No. Oh, panda. 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 Oh, that's what I get for going off script. We'll be sharing plans for the opening of Jay Cox Elementary School. Oh, Thank you, Dr. Litchmore. Panda. Yeah, all right. <laughs> no shelter, go ahead. Are you clicking it? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay.
Okay, there we go. All right, so good afternoon, good afternoon. school board chair Clanton, vice chair Dr. Gabriel, superintendent Birdsong, and members of the school board. My name is Dr. Lucy Litchborn, and I am the proud principal of Jaycox Elementary School, home of the pandas. <laughs> All right, so I'm here um, to share the plan for our, 2000, our upcoming school year 2022-2023. So you guys see the beautiful picture. But at Jaycox, we begin every meeting with celebrations because we have to find something to celebrate each day. And especially this year, we are so, so, so impressed and so overjoyed with our growth on our SOLs. But I'm going to keep to the script. <laughs> so um, our grade level okay. chairs, so our grade level chairs and instructional team volunteered, guys, volunteered to come out on August 3rd. So that is today to look at data to continue to plan for our upcoming school year. So um, planning included looking at the new reading curriculum. So we did a lot with that. We love that, by the way. Um, Edmentum data, Lexia data, SOL data. To, so that way we were noting the trends and next step. The teachers were able to partner up and um, break out into breakout groups and work together. Why do you think we got what we got? What are our next steps? So we're using that um, data. We're being intentional about it. Teachers are being accountable for it. We're doing vertical groups so that you can see that the data is impacted from kindergarten all the way up. It's not just three, four, and five. That was a little off the script. Um, <laughs> further, right. we are happy that we are um, partner. Our partners are back in full effect. Our partners at Jaycox, we love our partners. Our partnerships are amazing. And we always like to remember and remind our partners it takes a village. It takes a village to raise our scholars. Matter of fact, this weekend, Mr. Isabel will be hosting a community day at Jaycox on August 6th. It's a Saturday. And it's open to the public. We are doing a uniform and supply drive for our families on September 1st. And this, this will be in tandem with our meet and greet on the lawn event. We have great success with our events on the lawn. And our faith-based partners are sponsoring this event, so we thank, we are thankful for them. All right, so our data is moving in the right direction, and we are so happy about that. We will continue to work hard to ensure continuous progress. We have looked at our data and have devised a theme for the upcoming school year. I know our theme for this year is a continuing the drive, and the Jaycox is drive with a purpose to success celebrating our growth. We will stop, so just get the, you see the road sign. So we will stop, <laughs> self-reflect, right. reevaluate, and build relationship with all stakeholders. And it's the self-reflection that has become, I need a shirt that said I am self-reflective. We self-reflect every day. We have to own the data. We have to own what's going on in the building. So self-reflection is something that is huge and that is done with intentionality at Jaycox every day. Um, when needed, we will make U-turns. We will make U-turns and reroute our instruction to meet the needs of our scholars. So once again, that's looking at that data and, okay, now we need to turn around because something didn't go right. Looking at that data, rerouting our instruction so we could make sure we're leveling the playing field and meeting our scholars where they are. And we, we will be sure to slow down, taking time to acquire and process new information. And lastly, the last thing I have to say, we say it, I say it on every robocall, one team, one dream equals success. Go Panda Nation. Yes. So, <laughs> Wade Jenkins representing Wade Taylor High School. All right. Yes. They the home of the Titans, right? <laughs> That's right. Yes. I need Titans. <laughs> Good afternoon to our school board chair, Mr. Clanton, our vice chair, Dr. Gabriel, Dr. Birdsong, our superintendent, and respective school board members. I am Letitia Wade Jenkins, the very proud principal at Lake Taylor High School, home of the Mighty Titans. Thank you for allowing me to share the work that we are doing to prepare students for the upcoming school year. As we gear up for the upcoming school year, we have been intentional about charting our course. We have been reviewing and reflecting on our data, revisiting our comprehensive needs assessment, and our school improvement plan that will guide our work. 
Following the VDOE process model for continuous school improvement, we are identifying what we want to accomplish, determining what changes will result in improvement, and developing indicators that will enable us to monitor and assess the impact that it has on student achievement. As a part of that process, we have been planning for our ninth grade transition program that is designed to front load student success by having them to engage in a variety of activities and learning experiences. <coughs> Students will meet with school administrators and school counselors to discuss academic and career planning. They will also learn about diploma types, course credits, verified credits, and certifications needed in order to meet promotion and graduation requirements. Students will participate in academic sessions that will outline the steps to success. They will learn about the go-to people to reach out to for help and the support systems that we have in place that will guide them throughout their high school journey. Our ninth grade students will engage in team building activities and experience firsthand what it means to be a mighty titan at Lake Taylor High School. We're also very excited about our Titan Senior Fest. This event is held in August before the start of the school year to make sure that students are motivated and excited about their senior year. During Senior Fest, we make sure that they are equipped with all the information that they need to be successful. In addition to students reviewing their transcripts, students and parents engage in information sessions where colleges share information about their application process and scholarship information. Students have a chance to meet our access counselor and to get information about financial aid and to complete their FAFSA. In addition, we take this opportunity to share the importance of taking advanced placement and dual enrollment classes, and we give students another opportunity to register for these courses. Students are also able to review their class schedule and make adjustments as needed. I recognize that establishing relationships with parents early on is important. So during the ninth grade transition program, I will be hosting in-person and virtual meet and greet sessions with parents and families. Parents can sign up for these virtual sessions by visiting our school website or by contacting our main office. We're also hosting meet and greet sessions with our new teachers and staff members to welcome them to our Titan family. During this time, we are discussing plans of support and connecting them to faculty mentors. And finally, we are continuing to forge our community partnerships for the upcoming school year. In addition to continuing our partnerships with our faith-based organizations, we will be starting our second year partnership with our Leadership Academy and the Chick-fil-A Leadership Academy. This partnership entails a seven-month program that focuses on making an impact through action and leadership training within the local community. So we are excited about the upcoming school year and we look forward to welcoming our students. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share the plans of the Titan Learning Community at Lake Taylor High School. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Paul. Um, we appreciate the presentation. Um, colleagues, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to ask that if you have additional follow-up questions that you schedule it with Dr. Pohl and, um, and Dr. Birdsong for two-by-twos, um, but we're, we're a little bit behind. I just want to make sure we get on that one, but great information. Um, there's no votes need to be taken on it, so I'm not going to um, do that there. So thank you, Dr. Pohl. My pleasure. Thank and you, guys. so with the next item, school crisis plans, Mr. Mallory. Good evening or good afternoon, School Board Chair Clinton, mm -hmm. Vice Chair Gabriel, Board Members, and Dr. Birdsong. Okay. okay. Uh, Mr. Mallory, my apologies. Um, 
if, if I may, and I do apologize, I, and I know she has to leave, I wanted to make sure that the board members in our community have been introduced to our new transportation senior director, Ms. Ashley Fussell. So please stand to be recognized. <laughs> <laughs> already thinking about some very innovative and creative things for next school year so we're so very excited to have her and we did steal her from a neighboring district so I'm just <laughs> <laughs> so welcome aboard thank you thank you I thank appreciate you. it welcome. thank you Tim you're welcome thank you uh, this afternoon uh, we'll present the school's 2022-23 school crisis emergency management and medical emergency response plan also known as the school crisis plan for your approval. Following the presentation, we'll answer questions during the question and discussion period. This evening, we'll share the federal, state, federal and state requirements, Virginia School Safety Audit Protocol, template components for the crisis plans, questions and discussions, and requests for your consideration for approval. To begin, all K-12 schools and higher education institutions receiving federal preparedness monies through the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services are required to support the implementation of the National Incident Management System known as NIMS. NIMS is the United States single comprehensive system to implement all phases of school emergency management. Also, in accordance with the Virginia Code 22.1-279.8, school safety audits and school crisis emergency management and medical emergency response plans are required. Each school board shall ensure that every school that is supervised shall develop a written plan. As you're aware, the Department of Criminal Justice Services school safety requirements include the annual review of school crisis plans, the school safety audit protocol also includes the Virginia Schools School Survey of Climate and Working Conditions, the Crisis Management Plans, the School Safety Checklist, the School Safety Survey, and the Divisional Level Survey. For your information and knowledge, we included a complete copy of the template of the School Crisis Emergency Management and Medical Emergency Response Plan, which contains instructions for the schools to follow when various types of emergencies or situations occur. We have provided you excerpts from the templates so that you can easily review the crisis plan components. The components of the crisis plan ensure that each school has a detailed plan for use in case of an emergency. The document includes a record of changes form at the beginning where the school staff will log in changes and updates as they occur throughout the year. There's an order succession page that lists roles staff will assume should an emergency occur. In addition to floor plans, we have included maps that show alternate locations and emergency areas, which also included uh, maps that show alternate locations and emergency areas, excuse me. Emergency shutoff utility locations on campuses have also been identified in the plan with some schools including pictures of these areas. Other information shared in the plans that is confidential and stored by each school said the school staff are ready to assist in an emergency. We have completed our annual review of each school's emergency management and medical emergency response plans and have provided you uh, and have provided them for your review. Thanks so much for your time and efforts in reviewing our crisis plans. Following questions and discussions, we ask that you approve the school crisis emergency management and medical emergency response plans for your certification uh, by our school superintendent, uh, Dr. Birdsong. After the board has approved the certification process, copies of the plans will be provided to the City of Norfolk Department of Emergency Management to be shared with the Norfolk Police Fire Chiefs at that time. And at this time, we'll open the floor for any questions or discussions. Great colleagues, anybody? Jordan? Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate the work and um, um, enjoyed reading through the plans. My question is about the alignment or what's the uh, process for emergency crisis planning for, for this operation? So you, at, at central administration, is there something comparable that, that is developed? I would say we're in the process now of working with the city, this being a city building and a shared operational building, working with the city security director, and we've been in 
been in conference with them for the last couple of months and working with the city. Uh, they recently hired a security director. So working with them and trying to uh, come up with some solutions for this building because it is a shared building with human resources for the city, uh, Commonwealth Attorney's Office and school administration. Yeah, no, I, I support that. I think, I think what's been done for the local school crisis plans is, is great work. Uh, this tends to be the, the central hub. And so I think there should be some type of parallel plan that addresses the needs here, including the uh, whatever security plan for uh, employee and public parking, you know, just, just the whole review of how we make sure that this operation is also secure in terms of uh, crisis planning. There's been ongoing meetings also with the city's emergency management office, including all the city buildings, to include this building. Thank you. Thank you for thinking of us, Mr. Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Um, well, then I'll entertain a motion to adopt the, um, the school crisis plan. Second. Mr. Chairman, I move that we support the adoption of the school crisis plans. And I'll accept the second from this kind <laughs> <laughs> It's been moved and properly seconded that we adopt the uh, school crisis plans. Is there any further discussion? Chairing hearing none. Madam Clerk, we can call the roll. Azeen. Aye. Amson. Aye. Gabriel. Aye. Jordan. Aye. Martin. Aye. Rousen. Aye. Clanton. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Mallory. All right, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have community engagement plan fisc uh, for school year 23. Um, I take it Ms. Washington and her team? Yes, Ms. Washington. Oh. <clears throat> oh, there she goes. I'm sorry. I'm right looking over there. For sure. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good afternoon, Chairman Clanton, Vice Chair Dr. Gabriel, board members, Dr. Birdsong, and other members of the administration. I'm Michelle Washington, Director of Communications and Community Engagement, and I'm delighted to be here today. Community Engagement Coordinator Lee Eunice Brown is here as well. She's seated in the audience tonight. Our communications and community engagement efforts are guided by the principles established in continuing the drive, equity and excellence for all. During the last year, we have refreshed our communications toolbox and strengthened the foundations of our efforts to establish and sustain community partnerships to support students' engagement, success, and opportunities. First, a brief look back. While Norfolk Public Schools remain closed to outside visitors in support of our COVID-19 health and safety strategies, CCE took steps to build the foundation for a strong return to volunteer and community engagement. These steps included development of a comprehensive community engagement plan, an internal survey to identify needs, and implementation of the Raptor platform to streamline applications and background checks. Additionally, CCE developed and implemented a team strategic plan to direct our communications work in support of these goals. Implementation of our strategic plan included an overhaul of the division's website, npsk12.com. This overhaul provided a cleaner, brighter layout and improved user friendliness. It also allowed CCE to highlight communications and community engagement efforts by providing a dedicated community channel at the top of the page with one-click access to community engagement, volunteering, partnerships, and support for military families. CCE created a designated prominent button on the home page for surveys with an accompanying dedicated URL, www.npsk12.com surveys to ensure consistent, easy access for our efforts to collect input from our community. Moving forward, CCE will update this page with a brief description of results from the surveys and next steps in the process. Finally, CCE created a designated prominent NPS Now feature on its website as an additional tool to highlight news and notes from around the division. Community engagement finished the year strong with volunteers returning and the first ever faith-based partnership kickoff event. Goals for the coming school year will build on the success of the processes and procedures we established last year and align with the objectives, strategies, and measures included in continuing the drive. 
this page is really stubborn. Increasing trust amongst NPS's stakeholders through timely and transparent communication speaks to the very existence of the communications and community engagement team. CCE has begun work to support major division initiatives with comprehensive communications plans, including for capital improvement projects and the Ruffner School Transition Plan. <clears throat> Our work includes supporting our academic offerings with higher visibility for our specialty and other programs and division accomplishments, including progress on SOLs and enrichment programs at individual schools. We are currently in the midst of a data integration project that will allow us to effectively target specific user groups as well as our entire population via our mass messaging system, Blackboard Connect. Volunteers responded in force when CCE launched its new volunteer application and management portal in March, with the reopening of our schools to community members as the health emergency eased. We look to build a strong foundation in the year to come. Community engagement surveyed principals during the past school year to identify school needs that could be supported by volunteers and community partners, as well as schools in need of partnerships. Their survey also led to creation of a database to track these partnerships and to match resources to needs. The new volunteer application process and portal allows individuals to select schools and activities in which they would like to participate. Additionally, CCE will work to recruit additional community partners and to nurture our existing community relationships with public recognition of this support. This work has already begun with meetings with community groups to discuss both volunteer engagement within our schools and partnerships to amplify our message across partner communications networks. June's community kickoff for faith-based partnerships launched a significant component of this strategy to identify specific groups within our community to access their desire and resources to support our students and staff. To help increase the number of school and community partnerships, the Community Engagement Coordinator will implement a Community Engagement Council. This group of stakeholders will provide advice or direction and direction on promoting positive, meaningful community partnerships. NPS has defined roles for community partners to point interested groups toward the path to partnership. These include resource partners for materials and donation supports, service partners for mentors, tutors, internships, and guest speakers, and strategic partners for agreements that support the goals and mission of NPS, as well as the mission of the organization. These partners can provide space, programs, resources, or services. LinkedIn, a platform specifically designed to establish and expand networks of connected professionals, will support our efforts to reach businesses, organizations, and NPS alumni. CCE will use this tool to further multiple pieces of our strategy, including developing community partnerships, expanding recruitment efforts, and identifying and encouraging ambassadors from among our staff and alumni in support of the stellar education NPS provides. We will continue to ensure that our communications and messages are available in multiple formats, including print, and that our digital outreach efforts remain mobile compatible. To facilitate discussion around partnerships that support students' engagement, success, and opportunities, community engagement has created a list of ways to help centered around the needs of our academic year. The entire CCE team will support the work of community engagement through campaigns across all NPS platforms to encourage volunteers and partners to join us. We will refresh our We Want You Back campaign for the coming school year and continue to actively recruit new volunteers and partnerships. We have already dedicated a portion of our newsletter each month to recognizing community partnerships and volunteers. And we will expand this work, and we are currently examining methods and vehicles for recognition. Now, I would like to invite Norview Middle middle school principal Brandy Smedley to the podium to share some of the ways she and her school have actively recruited and engaged with school partners. I could just use this to yep. click to the next, okay.
Okay, uh, y'all can do better than that. Y'all want to cheer me on? One more time? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good evening, <coughs> Chairman Clanton, Doc, um, I apologize, Vice Chair Dr. Gabriel, board members Dr. Birdsong, and other members of the administration team. My name is Mrs. Brandy Smetley, and I'm the proud principal of Norview Middle School, home of the Navigators. <laughs> I would like to take a minute to share all of the great things that are happening at Norview Middle School in support of the community engagement goals set by the district. At Norview Middle School, we are partnering with a purpose, the Navigator Way. In an effort to achieve goal one, which is continue to expand community partners for schools, we have expanded our community partnership in a variety of ways. And I know I only have two minutes, but I have so much to share, but I'm gonna make it very quick. <laughs> <clears throat> this year, we have partnered with Old Dominion University men's basketball team to support our boys. They received mentors and an opportunity to attend a basketball game. I was there at that game too. I took advantage of that opportunity. The <laughs> team also came to the school to speak with our young men and they had a little one-on-one -on -one, uh, basketball. I tried to make a shot, it didn't work out, so I sat back down. <laughs> um, Norfolk State's Queen and You program has partnered with our girls club to provide approximately 20 mentors for one-on-one -on -one mentoring for our girls. Girls Club is a nonprofit organization which was founded by my assistant principal, Ms. <coughs> Mrs. Chakisha White. We also started Wellness Wednesdays, which we started virtually and we realized we wanted to keep that going throughout the school year once we were in, in person. And partnered with Langley Air Force Military Base to provide physical fitness drills and social emotional strategies to our students through health and PE classes. I must add I had a personal connection with Langley Air Force Base through a gentleman <laughs> by the name of Senior Master Sergeant Leroy Smetley. I got <laughs> So um, that's my husband, but I had a personal connection. You got to use it where you can, right? <laughs> Teens with a Purpose and many other organizations partner with our school through our 21st Century Grant by receiving, uh, by providing uh, resources and field trips to all of our students. And in an effort to achieve goal two, promoting community engagement between schools and the community, we have opened the doors to the community in various ways, whether it was virtually or in person. We always look forward to having our families in the buildings, but parents truly appreciated the option of being able to attend an award ceremony or even a concert virtually, so we made sure we made that happen in both ways. We held bi-monthly parent focus groups in the mornings and in the evenings to accommodate our working families, and this gave our parents an opportunity to discuss the topics that were important to them. We held family engagement fun nights where we were able to partner with Domino's Pizza right up the street. During this time, we experienced a fun-filled night of educational activities and games with our parents and students. We also had a very successful open forum called Bridging the Gap. This was right before the pandemic, and we're gonna keep that rolling uh, this upcoming school year. This event allowed families and community members to come into our building, discuss topics that were important to them, and they had an opportunity to talk to our faculty and staff, and we, act, we asked them questions, and they asked us questions. And we were not fearful to give them the answers, and we were able to come together to just come up with solutions that may need to help our, our school as well as the surrounding community. And this was a powerful event that we want to continue having annually. And most recently, we were able to partner with Chairman Carlos Clanton in an event called Community Connections, which will support the community and our students in a variety of ways. And lastly, we are working on achieving goal three, which is setting new goals based on our school needs. One of my history teachers, Ms. Alyssa Jackson, uh, has done an awesome job finding some local businesses that will support our students and teachers. We want to provide more ways the community can get involved and opportunities through our social media pages. 
we want to recognize a community partner each month. And now the volunteers as well, we want to recognize our volunteers each month. Most recently, through the amazing MPS Faith-Based Partnership Community Kickoff event, led by one of our executive directors, Dr. Doretha White, I was able to secure a partnership with one of the churches located directly in the Norview community, community that I was not aware of. And I was so excited to be able to attend that event and partner with that church. We're all, we've already met, I called her right away, she called me. We've already met and discussed some amazing ways that they can support Norview Middle School. So I want to thank you for giving me an opportunity to share some of the great things that are happening at Norview Middle School and will continue to happen at Norview Middle School, home of the Navigators. And please help me share some of the positive things that are happening at Norview Middle School and Norfolk Public Schools as a whole. Thank you. So, um, y'all making me so good. We're right, right there on good on time. But I will, if y'all, we got five minutes. Cool. We could Dr. Barton. I just real quick want to say, I think that the community, your role um, with our you know, greater division is so important to communicating and engaging our external stakeholders. And I think that um, you've been here a year, a little Not over a year. Okay. Well, I think you've done an amazing job. I really felt like the um we want you back campaign to attract volunteers was one of the key pieces that i saw that and i said okay this is what norfolk public schools need to be needs to be putting out i felt like you hit your stride there um it was engaging which of course you have to be engaging obviously it's part of the job but um but we haven't always done a great job at, at doing that and i thought that was engaging it was entertaining it was adorable professional and it communicated well and so um so i just want to say thank you so much and um and do more of that like that's what i think you know we want we want people to be interested and and entertained at the same time but get the message and i think you hit it on all marks so thank you okay and so with that um i i want to recognize because you have a dynamic team that works with you doing that right um so miss brown um she's the boots on the ground <laughs> <over there. laughs> And they're in that room watching us on these cameras <laughs> for that creative team um, in Channel 47. I know um, they're listening. Yeah. They're listening. <laughs> Mr. Jordan. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, number one, I, I appreciate the work. I uh, very much appreciate the uh, how much the social media uh, is success has been, it's been out there. I, I think yeah. it's very impressive and uh, appreciate that and encourage you all to, to keep going. The the one thing I circled that, not surprisingly, uh, Principal Smitley hit on when she mentioned uh, parent focus groups. Yep. So I think that uh, we know when we're doing surveys, uh, that it's very important that we look at ways of taking that example and broaden it and distributing it throughout the division. You know, even when we're doing climate surveys and and other surveys, there are. Um, uh, some individuals, some cultures, some groups, some communities that respond much better in a focus group and respond much better when there's someone standing in front of them like Principal Smedley, mm -hmm. who they feel they have a relationship with and can trust. And so you often in that focus group may be able to get more, uh, more information and, and some raw feedback that you may not be able to type into, into a survey. So I'm, I'm definitely a, a, a proponent of, uh, of doing that. And then the last comment on the internal and external stakeholder groups. I like for us to be even more intentional about trying to, uh, in our efforts around inclusion and, and equity and opportunity, to give special attention to African-American parents and African-American fathers in particular. Uh, Often when I'm here in meetings or, or go home after meetings and think about the discussions and presentations that we get, I think uh, black parents are underrepresented in our discussions. And I mean black parents of Norfolk Public School students, 
or North Public School alumni. And so I think we need to be much more intentional. I think in our room right now, I don't know who's behind me, but we might have two or three parents, uh, African-American parents of NPS students or NPS alumni, and even fewer when you uh, target it just, just for fathers. And I think considering the demographics of our population and the importance of family and the importance of uh, fathers on positive student outcomes, that that's something I like to see us drill down on. But thank you for all the great work. Ms. Basine. Yes, I too. Thank you for all the great work um, and the energy that is being put forward um, through uh, the various modes of communication that have been uh, communi communication and engagement uh, that that the division has been engaging in. It's been great to see. Um, so along the same lines as what Mr. Jordan just uh, uh, alluded to, um, you know, as part of the community. I think the family as being you know the third leg of that stool also being a real critical component um, so I was just gonna say as as we talk about community organizations and and things you know also how we can improve our family engagement um, and also by doing that also looking at our family engagement policy and see how well we are upholding that policy do we need to make changes to it you know how how we can actually measure how well we're engaging our families. Um, and I completely support, you know, what Mr. Jordan has put forward by um, increasing our efforts around inclusion uh, and diversity. Um, so I would like to see that. I would also, I think it would be great, I mean, the same incredible gusto that was put towards, you know, engaging our faith-based community partners, I think, you know, to also put that similar efforts around our business leaders um, and other community organizations as well. I think there's great opportunity to, um, you know, have schools partner with businesses to provide, you know, uh, material support, but as well as internships and externships, you know, things that um, we can connect learning with real life applications. So I think, you know, we've had organ organizations come forward to us and say, you know, we wanna, we wanna be part of, um, building strong students and what can we do to help and I think there's a lot of energy around that and I think that same energy that was put forward with the faith-based uh, organizations should be put also with our business and community organizations and, I, and I'm sure there are plans potentially for that as well um, and lastly so I have other thoughts but the other piece is the indicators and this was part of some of the feedback that I gave around the strategic plan is um, I think it's great that we are increasing the number of volunteers, the number of partnerships, but then really connecting that to are we producing positive results or positive student outcomes as a result of those partnerships? Are they meaningful partnerships? And really trying to identify how we might measure that. Um, because, you know, I think in the past we've had a lot of partnerships, but have they really been beneficial for our students in our school communities that has not always you know been the case um, so I think when we get to that point of having that discussion on the strategic plan I'd like to see more of that but um, I'll just end with that but right. great work and right. look forward to additional conversations around this. Thank you. Uh, great points. I'm writing some things down here. I know Dr. Birdsong we've had and thank you Principal Smedley. Um, We've had some discussions around parents and parental engagement. I, I know that we used to have a parent university, but there's some new things that are in the works. So I'm not going to steal a thunder. Um, mm -hmm. okay. But I, I, these are all great points here. <laughs> and I'm making notes, and so we'll follow up and put it in our um, in our parking lot of things that we'll come back and address. Thank you so much. You. Oh, yep. Can I can I just add one thing? Sure. So because we've talked about this and it's been recommended by other board members, um, but just as a refresher and reminder. So we talked about parent-teacher conferences and then, you know, really having that time in the beginning of the year to say, you know, bring families in and say, this is where your student is, this is where we're trying to get them, you know, so that we're really engaging them along the way. And however, whether it's a day that the whole division uses, you know, I don't know, that's, you know, for the division to decide, but really having that be 
kind of a directive from the board that's saying that we want to see that, that there is that, you know, connection made with, with each and every parent, guardian, mm -hmm. um, caretaker, you know, at the beginning of the year. Right. I've got it down here. Thank you so much, Ms. Washington. Thanks mm -hmm. all for the great conversation. We are, um, yeah. uh, Dr. Birdsong, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Mr. Clanton, Vice Chair, Dr. Gabriel, members of the board, administration, and our community. Um, thank you for the opportunity this afternoon to share with you my recommendation for the student school board representative and alternate. Certainly the school, uh, the administration, we followed uh, school board regulation BBB as we went through the process of, of making this recommendation to you. So this evening, I'm recommending that the board select Naya Muir as the student representative of the school board of the city of Norfolk for the 22-23 school year. Naya is a senior at Moray High School and she's enrolled in the school's medical and health specialty, specialties program. She's been described by her teachers as poised, mature, hardworking, goal-oriented, and a highly skilled communicator. She has a wide range of committed interests, including band, taekwondo. She even has a black belt, which I thought was amazing. That's part of your uh -huh. security plan. <laughs> right, that is the security <laughs> plan. <laughs> right next to it. <laughs> Theater, theater and writing. She um, has received numerous accolades in all of these areas and has achieved at a very high level in her academic coursework, maintaining at least a 5.0 GPA while taking several <laughs> advanced placement courses. She is outstanding and it's beyond a 4.0, but I'll say it's at least that, it's beyond that. <coughs> but perhaps one, one area most notable in Naya's numerous accomplishments is her commitment to the Black Student Union at Maury High School. She actually founded that organization, and so she takes great pride in leading that organization and involving the community and, and certainly the students um, at Maury High School. When Naya was asked why she believes she should be selected to represent the students of Norfolk Public Schools as the board's uh, representative, representative, her response was as follows. I have learned to empathize listen and advocate not just for students but teachers and administrators who dedicate their lives to improving our school division. The people of NPS are more than just a statistic to me as I have built <coughs> lifelong connections with astounding people who remind me how our public school division is filled with genuine humans that want the best for every student that walks through those front doors. So again, I present to you Ms. Naya Muir, which is my recommendation for the board student school board representative. I would also like to recommend that the board select Jordan Wicker as the alternate student member of the school board. Um, Jordan is a senior at Lake Taylor High School. She is described by her teachers as energetic, outgoing, intelligent, responsible, and hardworking. Her work ethic, passion, and drive are all characteristics of a true leader. Jordan's principal describes her as insightful, reflective, and passionate about making a difference in the lives of others. As a student athlete, Jordan takes great pride in serving as the captain of Lake Taylor High School's volleyball team. She has enjoyed playing volleyball for at least the, the last nine years, and she's also a member of the school's track team as well. Outside of school, Jordan is known for her work with the nonprofit or organization Strong Willed Survivor, which focuses on providing support to children and families who have chronic or life threatening illnesses. Jordan serves as the nonprofit's vice president, which is extremely impressive. Jordan also enjoys volunteering her time at the nursery at her church, and so she looks forward to doing that on a weekly basis. She's also gainfully employed. Can you imagine, in, in addition to everything else that she does, she's gainfully employed at a local hotel. And she also babysits for um, some military families in, in our area. Um, and she's highly recommended. I'm too bad my kids are too old for that, because I certainly <laughs> would have uh, selected her as a babysitter. 
Jordan plans to attend a four-year university and she wants to pursue a career as a special education teacher. So when she said that, I was like, okay, <laughs> you don't need to say anything else. When Jordan was asked why she believes she should be selected to represent the students in Norfolk Public Schools as a student member of the City of Norfolk School Board, her response was as follows. I would like to make a difference in the lives of Norfolk Public School students. In addition, I want to share my ideas with the school board so they can better understand the students' point of views or points of view in Norfolk Public Schools. And one of Jordan's teachers noted that as an educator, it was an honor and a privilege to teach students such as Jordan who share your same level of passion and respect for their own education. Again, I present to you, Ms. Jordan Wicker, my recommendation for the board student alter alternate for school year 23. Thank you, Great. Uh, thank you uh, Dr. Birdsong. Um, do I hear a motion to accept Ms. Naya Noor as the school board representative and Ms. Jordan Wicker as the alternate? I move to accept Ms. Naya Noor. Muir. Muir. And Muir. Ms. Jordan Wicker. 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 As both the uh, school board representative and alternate for the 2022-23 school year as recommended by Dr. Sharon Bruce, song superintendent. Great. Thank you, Dr. Barton. <laughs> Do I hear a second? Second. All right, it's been seconded by uh, Dr. Gabriel. Um, it's been moved and properly seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none? Well, oh, just, just one comment. Yes. Uh, and I know Ms. Bassine has mentioned this uh, before. When we first brought forward the idea of having a student rep uh, to the school board and the board and administration supported that, part of the intent was to make sure that we pr really gave an opportunity for voice in in our discussions in our deliberation and I would just like to see as we bring on these excellent uh, candidates or recommendations that we also talk about as a board how we can make sure that their voice is uh, a part of the deliberations in a in a very um, genuine genuine way I appreciate that, Mr. Jordan. Um, after attending the National School Board Association conference in uh, San Diego, elevating the student voice was one of the things, and I know Dr. Martin, you were with me with that one, and that is something that we're looking at. Um, the handbook, we've had some discussions about um, the various things that those student representatives can do, and one of the things that we're also looking at, um, and will be presented to the board at a later time, is when we talk about public comment, actually having a public comment for students and encouraging students to come before the board to provide their input. But that will be one of the goals, elevating the student voice on this coming year. Thank you. Is there any additional discussion? Yeah. Hearing none, um, Madam Clerk, will you please you call the roll? Oh, did you have a question? I'm sorry, did I cut someone off? No, I, I was just gonna, I was, well, I was just gonna support, you know, that that's something that I had been mm -hmm. asking about. Yep. And also uh, job description, like have more of a role. And we have a job description. Well, uh, well, the one thing that I had asked to be an agenda topic as well was just, you know, we have the policy. Mm -hmm. Are we meeting the goals and objectives of the policy in how we're utilizing our school board reps so that that is a meaningful engagement? And that's where um, the work, that's where the handbook is kind of coming out of that to, to kind of talk about how we implement that. So when they come in, we orient who they're working with and so yeah, forth. Because we've had fantastic representatives yeah. yep. and like to great thank you for all those, is elevated. those yeah. comments there um miss tanner you ready okay sing aye hampson aye gabriel aye jordan aye martin aye rousen aye clanton aye thank you um the two additional items that we have under the discussion uh, Discussion decision items is 3.08, the Valvin contract amendment, and then 3.09, which is the minutes from the July uh, 20th um, uh, yep, meeting. So with the Valvin contract, um, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the uh, amendment. I move to adopt the, the um, Valbrun group contract as amended. Wait, thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and properly seconded that we adopt the Balvin contract as amended. Um, for this particular section, in um, lieu of time, I will um, I'll allocate five minutes for discussion once it's exhausted. Um, we've had a bit of a discussion, so um, we didn't want to like any discussion. Mr. Jordan. Not, not really discussion, but I would like to uh, 
recommend that we go back and look at the our school board's budget and make sure if if these uh, resources are coming out of one of our line items that we have sufficiently provided the resources there we really didn't get a chance to talk about the school board's budget for for this year and so just like to encourage that we go back and, and look at that and get an update as to how this contract uh, would impact the school board's budget and for any considerations of, of revisions as, as needed okay so mr jordan's asking that we uh, take some time to review the um, approved uh, school board budget time okay anyone else Ms. Same. did you have anything i yeah i just I, i've expressed my um Understand. thoughts in closed session so I'll okay all right um madam clerk if you'll go ahead and proceed with the uh, roll call the scene a hampson aye gabriel aye jordan nay martin aye browson aye clanton aye thank you um we are now at um item 3.09 the minutes from july 20th oh, bless you. Uh, yeah bless you um Ms. Bessine, you're the maker who removed it from the consent agenda. So would you like to speak to it? Yes. So there is, um, I think it was 6.03 under the minutes that um, the motion that we adopt um, the strategic plan goals and objectives, which I thought, I think it was the direction. Again, that was the piece mm -hmm. that we agreed that the direction was versus the actual goals and objectives in the plan. Um, if I'm not mistaken, if uh, so, that was just that correction. So I. Okay, I, I agree um, that it was direction. We haven't uh, adopted a final right. document on that. Right. So, um, is there any other amendments? I accept that was that, that was, was the, the primary amendment. One? So I just wanted. So to... So you said it was six point. Uh... I believe it was six point zero three on the minutes. And say which meeting are you referring to? I'm, I'm sorry, it's referring to the July 20th. 6.02. Oh, Strategic 6 plan, goals, and vote yes. required, motion. Um, and we're going to add a motion is to uh, adopt the direction, correct? Yes. Okay. The, yes. Um, do I have any objections to making a correction to the minutes? Okay, hearing none. Are there any objections to uh, adopting the corrected minutes? Hearing none, the minute stand um, approved is corrected. Um, we are now at the uh, consent agenda, um, which is the personnel report and um, approval of July 6th minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda Mr. as amended? Chairman, yes. Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the consent agenda. Uh, it's been moved. Do I hear a second? Second. All right, Dr. Martin has seconded. It's been moved and properly seconded that we approve the consent agenda as amended. All those in favor signify, well, Madam Clerk, you can call the roll. <laughs> Wait, is there any objection? All right, if chair hearing none, it's approved. Okay. All right, and so um, we did the photo already. I caught up. All right. All right, thanks, Sean. Oh, I was looking like what, what's, what's going on? <laughs> you want her to call the what, roll. What would I need to do? Yeah, that's what. <laughs> well, what? No, don't call roll call. I just did consent, general consent, okay, no objection. So we're okay, good. thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody. Yeah. Um, we got back a little bit of time there the, the board has um, some additional items we have to go into an executive session um, I just want to reiterate the um, fact um, we start doing a round robin I'm not going to do that here because of the time uh, but I would take a privilege here that um, I want those who are in this room and those who are watching um, that deliberation is just that and so we may not always agree but we don't need to be disagreeable. And I wanted the community to see, even though Mr. Jordan and myself didn't agree on something at the beginning, we're not gonna be disagreeable throughout this meeting. We still have work to do. And so I encourage everyone, as we're continuing to move through, that we get back on track. We keep making the main thing the main thing, and I appreciate everybody helping us to do that today. All right, so with that, I will accept um, a motion to enter executive closed session. Mr. Chairman, I move that we enter into closed session. Do I hear a second? A second. Been moved and properly seconded, and we enter an executive closed session. Is there, well, Madam Clerk, will you please read the um, resolution? That was Gabriel and Rouse, correct? Yes. Yes. Yep. Move that members of the school board go into a closed session for the purposes which are set out in subsection A of section 2.2 371 1 
of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act as amended for discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of the school board of the city of Norfolk, pursuant to subsection 2.2-3711A1 of the act. The subject of this portion of the session is the annual evaluation of the division superintendent required by Virginia Code sections 22.1-60.1 and 22.1-253.13-5. Consultation with legal counsel and briefing by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where discussion and open session would adversely affect the school board's negotiating or litigating posture and consultation with legal counsel regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by counsel pursuant to subsections 2.2-3711A7 and 8 of the Act. The subject of this portion of the session is that is that set out above in subsection A of this motion for consultation with legal counsel as needed. The scene. Aye. Hampson. Aye. Gabriel. Aye. Jordan. Uh, I'm going to say I just had one, one point. Uh, on the on our board docs agenda, can we just make sure that those motions are updated on the on board docs? Because I, I see the one that we did earlier under consent. And I just want to make sure that we're documenting this motion as well. As soon as I oh, no, no, guys I, finish, no, no, I can just, do that right away. I just want to make sure that. <laughs> okay. Good. No. Great. Um, um, thank you. Point taken. Thank you. Yes. Aye. Okay. Martin. Aye. Rousen. Aye. Clanton. Aye. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, we are now going to enter into executive closed session.